Good morning. My name is Cecilia Solhoff, and I am an outreach specialist in the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau here at the FCC. I want to thank you all for coming today. Uh, we are broadcasting this workshop live on the web. Uh, for those of you who are watching remotely, you can submit questions for the panelists by submitting an email to livequestions at FCC.gov. Uh, those of you sitting here in the room today, we have no cards and pens. We have a couple uh, FCC staff standing in the back of the room, one on either side with note cards and pens. If you have a question, you can write your question on the note card and then raise your hand. They'll collect it from you. We ask that you please write your name and what company you're affiliated with, um, with all questions submitted either through email or here in the room on the note cards. Every, uh, we are going to have several presentations um, today, slide presentations. So the slide presentations and the handout that's in the back that includes the agenda and the bios for almost all of the speakers um, will be available on the event webpage at www.fcc.gov slash events slash collocations dash workshop. So that will be shortly after, um, within a day or two after, the, um, after today. Um, we're going to have a couple of introductory speakers this morning with some opening remarks. Uh, then we're going to have a presentation by the FCC and then three panels. We'll have a break for lunch um, uh, for about an hour or so midday and then two panels this afternoon. If you think of questions, please write them down or submit the email as soon as you think of them. Don't wait till the end because due to time constraints and the volume of questions we receive, we will try to get to as many as we can. So now our first speaker is Jane Jackson. Jane is an Associate Chief in the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau here at the FCC. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, both present, present currently on the web and present in the future on the web. Um, as Cecilia said, I'm Jane Jackson. I'm Associate Chief of the Wireless Bureau. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's forum on co-locating wireless broadband antennas on towers and other structures, which the Wireless Bureau is very pleased to host in conjunction with NOTOA. I would also like right now to thank Jeff Steinberg, Dan Abeda, and Don Johnson from the Wireless Bureau, who have played key roles in organizing today's event. As you know, one of Chairman Janikowski's top priorities is increasing the reach of mobile broadband. There is every indication that wireless internet connectivity has the power to create economic opportunity, increase civic participation in government, improve education, and, of course, let us have fun both before, after, and during those other things. That's why we are hard at work every day trying to identify and reallocate additional spectrum that can be used to provide mobile broadband. We're making progress, but it's going to take time, and it's not enough. Smartphone and tablet sales keep going up and up, and I am willing to bet that I am not the only person in this room currently right here in possession of three wireless devices that are broadband capable. Yeah. Anybody not have one on their person right now? Uh, I see one hand. <laughs> and he's with a friend. Okay. <laughs> with all of this, the demands on our nation's wireless infrastructure are soaring. In order to meet this challenge, we must deploy the mobile broadband infrastructures that can take fullest advantage of the spectrum that's available today. And one way to do this is by leveraging the existing physical assets out there by co-locating wireless broadband antennas on towers and other available structures. And that's why we're having this forum today. I am very pleased that working with NATOA, we've been able to bring together representatives of companies that have successfully co-located wireless broadband antennas on towers and other structures with the communities that are served by wireless and mobile broadband. We hope that everyone participating in the workshop here remotely and everyone that will see this webcast later will come away not only with a better understanding of co-location, but also with information necessary to understand how co-locations promote mobile broadband in your community. 
So once again, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks to everyone who made it possible. Have an enjoyable and informative time. Now we'll have some remarks from Jennifer Manor. Jennifer is a Deputy Chief in the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau here at the FCC. Good morning, everyone, and thank you. Um, I'm very excited to be here because this is an incredibly important workshop, not just for industry, but also for public safety. On February 22nd, the Middle Class Tax Relief and Jobs Act, what we call the Spectrum Act, was signed into law, and this kind of builds on what Jane was talking about, the need for increased broadband spectrum. And so for the first time in the history of the country, there's going to be deployed a nationwide public safety broadband network um, for public safety, which is bringing a paradigm shift in the provision of wireless telecommunications to the public safety community. A part of this shift that's clearly envisioned in the Spectrum Act is premised on public-private partnerships. And actually, the Act specifically talks about leveraging both public and commercial infrastructure by public safety to bring this network to fruition. So the information that's being shared today from a public safety perspective is critical to the build out of this network. So I was very, very excited um, at the workshop's agenda and the information that's going to be shared. Of course, public safety still has incredibly important build outs it's doing for its narrowband communications. So between the two, I think the information that's going to be given today is going to be instrumental in the design of the public safety broadband network and the continuing design and rollout of the narrowband networks. So with that, I hope that everyone um, gets to learn a lot today from today's panelists and walks away with lots of important information as these networks go forward. So thank you. Our next speaker will be Tony Perez, who is the president-elect of the National Association of Telecommunications Officers and Advisors, or NATOA, as everybody here, I'm sure, knows them. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, and I'm happy, happy to be here on uh, behalf of uh, NATOA and uh, local governments across the country. I want to uh, thank the commission and uh, particularly staff from the uh, wireless division for making possible this very timely uh, and, and important workshop. Uh, we in local government, uh, uh, we want uh, more uh, robust uh, broadband coverage and, and, and more uh, active uh, uh, competition. In my 25 years of serving uh, local governments, primarily in the telecommunications and technology sector, I have never heard one public official mention that or bemoan that their community has too much connectivity. So uh, we, we are fully uh, vested in ensuring the, 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 the rapid and efficient uh, deployment of broadband wireless infrastructure. We understand that we're big users of wireless services for public safety and an array of applications uh, that uh, make government services more economical, uh, more efficient, and allow us to serve our constituents in, in new and innovative ways. Uh, we also uh, understand that uh, the, the industry, both the, the wireless service providers, the, the tower owners, uh, they're fully invested in trying to uh, optimize the, the customer experience, uh, reward shareholders, and, and lead our, our country to the forefront of broadband uh, uh, connectivity. So I think we have a special responsibility, both uh, local governments uh, and the industry, to uh, demonstrate to our respective uh, constituents and customers that our objectives are not incompatible. So um, I'm really excited to be here uh, uh, today. Uh, it's my hope that the examples of the cooperative ventures that we hear, to the, hear today uh, will be part of a broader uh, conversation that will lead to more constructive engagements to meet these mutual uh, objectives and that we can spend more of our time in uh, getting uh, broadband infrastructure uh, deployed and, and more advanced applications developed and spending less of our time in, uh, let's say, um, less constructive efforts like uh, litigation and, and other things that uh, miss the mark. So thank you very much.
Thank you, Tony. Our last uh, set of opening remarks will be from Joyce Dickerson, who is the chair of the FCC's Intergovernmental Advisory Committee and councilwoman for Richland County, Georgia. Joyce is going to be presenting her remarks via teleconference, so you'll hear her, but you won't see her. Uh, good morning. This is Joyce Dickerson. Thank you for this precious opportunity. And uh, I would like to correct one thing. We are from South, I'm from South Carolina, and you probably caught the southern accent this morning. However, I do want to thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you this morning. I want to thank uh, Chief Kaplan, Don Johnson, and all others for including me in this presentation. And that also includes the WTB as well as Natoya. Uh, on behalf of the IAC, I am pleased to participate in this workshop on co-location of wireless and broadband antennas on co communication towers and other structures. We are clearly, uh, as we can clearly see, the idea of co-location can promote as well as expedite mobile broadband deployment while ensuring emergency preparedness for enhanced public safety. However, the IAC members have not had the opportunity to spend a great deal of time discussing this topic, so we are looking forward to working with our subcommittees. There are numerous considerations relative to the business and aspect of the carriers, which um, when it addressed technical towers and other structure type co-locations. In other words, we have not had a lot of discussion, and our discussion, as I stated earlier, has been limited. But keep in mind that the IEC was just uh, reinstated in November 2011, and since that time we've only had two um, meetings uh, of the four that we're supposed to have quarterly, uh, but we've had several conference calls. And we're looking to prepare ourselves to make great recommendations to the FCC and other organizations on behalf of the IAC. Uh, and IAC, we have, have decided to break our uh, committee up into four sections, and basically, I mean five, and we basically have those uh, sections, and we are working very hard to make those recommendations as we continue to pursue goals and objectives uh, to present to the committee. Uh, with that said, the IAC believes explicitly that the following is inevitable. Um, the main benefits for state and localities, we believe, are as follows. Uh, we understand co-location is facing real challenges. There are advantages and disadvantages, which varies from state to state when it comes to infrastructure, especially when it deals with tower locations. Local zoning and many other areas throughout the nation prohibits and dictate locations. One size, as we know, does not fit all when it comes to um, co-locations. There are diverse conceptualizations that differ dramatically um, relative to dense cities, small municipalities, and rural areas. In all areas to location, location, location is everything, and the trend is location. Location, first of all, means less towers going up in municipalities, while it expands benefits to rural America. I believe we can all agree that co-location, whenever possible, is essential and, and a practical methodology. However, the variations in infrastructure certainly could enhance the service and hopefully a deduction in cost to the consumer and yet profitable for the carrier. Um, while this um, competition means an average of about maybe three to, um, as we are looking at it, three to four carriers per tower when the towers are collated within the FCC carriers, uh, which means more competition and choices for the consumer. Co-location has the potential to generate revenue to states and localities which owns towers for public safety um, licenses. We also believe that there is a tremendous economic benefit uh, and it predicts and is predicated upon the supply and demand of service to the consumer. And immediately, um, immediate tower space for wireless broadband, such as mobile broadband network, uses co-location antennas so, and also smartphones. This uh, also indicates localities can rent their spaces if they own. This is what we are probably will probably visit co-location as we. Um, will go forward will mean we're looking at less towers in municipalities. Localities encourage co-location to reduce the number of towers um, for co-location to help expand the service, especially to our rural areas. 
It is believed that um, the co-locations is facing challenges, as I stated earlier, um, I guess basically from the previous actions of council. As we attempt to serve the underserved and the unserved, there we must continue this service to minimize the cost to consumer while we address carriers' profitability, um, which brings us back to adoption and deployment prospectively. Emergency preparedness and serving the unserved at minimal cost to them is the forefront, is, I believe, would be the forefront of this discussion today. And um, just want to make a quote. Um, um, and we all well know that, you know, in the early 90s, uh, we had less towers, and most people were not as astute, basically, uh, to work on certain, um, to, to, to allow a lot of towers to go up. And so, but now today, with all of the, um, the demands, it's certainly uh, they're requiring uh, more towers. So we were looking at fewer towers, smaller, uh, taller uh, structures, and hopefully the aesthetics will it will help us to maintain great aesthetics to radiate various communities. And so one concern is the aesthetics, as I as I just mentioned. So despite the regular stream of um, government agencies worldwide, um, a reassign a spectrum, broadband problems with interference per se are not getting any better, uh, but we hopefully with this workshop today that we'll be able to address some of the issues that will reduce and um, take care of uh, some of the, uh, I believe, um, w um, the um, things that would that would cause people to be turned off by these towers. So uh, I believe this is a strong indication of the service and that is very much needed. And uh, as we know that this is non-traditional, um, but we need to work on things like adding these um, uh, towers basically to telephone poles and street lights, you know, to um, to make sure that we can reduce um, additional towers. So again, on behalf of the members of the IAC, I hope um, our comments will broaden the discussion today on co-location and structural in um, infrastructure to provide better, effective, efficient service to um, to our consumers, as well as provide economic um, growth growth. Hello? Thank Hello? You. We're still okay. here. Oh. Uh, I just wanted to just, I, I, I heard a click and I didn't know whether or not I was cut off, but we look, um, on behalf of the IAC, we look forward to continued relationships and building an impeccable partnership as we go forward to improve the service on telecommunication technology prospectively. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the IAC, this concludes my remarks, and thank you so much for allowing me to participate. Have a wonderful conference. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you. So our first session today will be a presentation, um, the legal framework, and it's going to be given by Jeff Steinberg. Jeff is the Deputy Chief of the Spectrum Competition and Policy Division in the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau here at the FCC. Thank you, Cecilia, and thank you to all of our um, introductory speakers. Um, we have a lot to look forward to today in terms of learning about the, the technology and, and the business cases and solutions, so I sort of apologize for beginning by boring you with um, a legal lecture, but um, as we thought about this, um, you know, we did think it was important to, um, to set the framework because everything that we do does need to take place within the context of the statutes and the regulations that, that govern the area. And I think they are there for a purpose to, to sort of set some frameworks, um, hopefully that we can work within to, to really reach the right results for everybody. And especially given the, the new legislation that, that Jennifer mentioned, the, um, the, the Spectrum Act, to call it by a short form, which isn't its actual name, um, that, that 
I, I know there are a lot of questions in people's minds, so we thought that it was important to, to go over that as we start. Um, just first, a, a quick overview of, of what I'm going to cover. There are really three major legal sources that I, th that I think people need to take into account as they're devising their strategies and their processes in this area. Um, the first one is 42 U.S.C. 332 C7, also known as Section 704 of the Telecommunications Act of 1996, which that's sort of the, the granddaddy here, and I think you're all familiar with it, um, been working with it for years, but it's still important and want to go over it as part of the framework. Um, then there is the shot clock ruling that the FCC came out with a few years ago that interpreted Section 332 C7. And then finally, there is the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act, the new legislation in February, which sets some additional boundaries on co-location decisions, and I'll be spending the bulk of my presentation on that. <coughs> So to begin with Section 332C7, um, that, um, first of all, is, is broader than co-locations, of course. It governs all siting of personal wireless service facilities. Um, that includes new towers as well as co-location of antennas on towers, on buildings, water tanks, any other kinds of structures. Um, the general structure of Section 332C7 is that it preserves state and local authority over decisions regarding the placement of these facilities subject to certain restrictions. Um, it does not address the allocation of authority between state and local governments. That has come up in, in a few cases. And essentially, if the, if the state government, as um, a couple of states do, want to, to centralize some of the rules governing these things or the um, decisions, that's up to the state. It doesn't preserve local authority as against the state. If the state, in a more traditional sense, leaves these decisions up to localities, that's fine, too. 332C7 has nothing to do with that. Um, it also provides, in general, that disputed cases are resolved by the courts, not by the FCC. If, uh, um, if a carrier or another interested party is aggrieved by a local party's decision or lack of decision, their remedy is to go to the courts. Um, the only exception is if it's a decision based on the effect of radio frequency emissions, those can be brought to the FCC. So very quickly, and I know you're all familiar with this, just going through the limitations that 332C7 imposes upon local governments or state governments. Um, their decisions may not unreasonably discriminate among providers of functionally equivalent services. They may not prohibit or have the effect of prohibiting the provision of services. Um, the government must act on an application within a reasonable period of time. Any denial of an application must be made in writing and must be supported by substantial evidence in a written record. And the government may not regulate the placement of these facilities based upon the effects of RF emissions to the extent that the facilities comply with FCC regulations governing those emissions. Um, within the boundaries of those things, um, Section 332C7 leaves authority up to the local government or the state government. So moving on then to the shot clock decision from 2009, um, which um, was affirmed by the Court of Appeals earlier this year. Um, what that decision does is it interprets the, um, the provisions in Section 332C7 that a decision must be made within a reasonable period of time and that an aggrieved party may file suit within 30 days upon a failure to act by a local government. Um, those two terms were undefined in the statute, and the, the petition um, basically indicated and the commission accepted that there was a need to interpret those. Um, the decision, like Section 332C7 itself, addresses both petitions for new towers as well as co-locations. Um, just a sort of note here, not um, of particular interest, but for completeness, um, not particularly to what we're discussing today, there was a second part of that shot clock decision as well, which interpreted what it means to have the effect of prohibiting service in Section 332C7, and that decision is that um, a local government may not deny an application solely because one or more carriers serve a given geographic market. 
So what was the holding um, with regard to the shot clock itself, the time period? Um, what it did um, basically to, you know, to go over the major points, the holding established that a presumptively reasonable period of time to decide an application is 90 days if it's a co-location of an antenna on an existing structure and 150 days for any other type of application, essentially a new tower. Um, and the reasoning for the two different time periods was that co-locations are unlikely to have significant impacts on the community because it's really just adding an antenna to, um, to a um, structure that's already there. Um, if the time period is exceeded, then the aggrieved party may file suit within 30 days as set forth in the statute. Um, the, um, the decision also provides that an applicant and the government that's making the decision may agree to toll this period. So um, the idea of that was we didn't want to set, you know, the strict 150 days if there's productive negotiations going on on day 140 and, you know, the, the carrier or whoever it is, the, the party constructing, who wants to construct the tower, um, doesn't want to feel forced that, to have to file suit. So, we, you know, we didn't, we didn't want to force more litigation that wasn't necessary. So, so th there can be an agreement to toll the period. Um, if a suit is filed, there is a presumption that the 90-day or 150-day period, whichever is applicable to the case, is reasonable, but that may be rebutted in court by the local government. Ultimately, the court will decide whether the period was reasonable under all the facts of the case, and if the court does find that the reasonable period was exceeded, then it has the discretion to determine the appropriate relief. Okay, so now moving on to the recent legislation, and there are actually three provisions or sets of provisions in this law that are relevant to co-locations and to the topics that we're discussing today. Um, the first one, which I'll spend most of my time on, is Section 6409A of the Act, um, which governs local review of tower modification requests. Um, but then there's also um, Section 6409, subsections B and C, and these provisions go to federal easements, rights of way, and buildings, and they um, they direct the, um, the, um, the the GSA and others to to develop certain um, procedures for for locating facilities on federal property, um, both um, putting towers up in easements and rights of way, and um, putting antennas and on buildings. I'm not going to talk about those any further. They go strictly to federal property. They don't go to um, to local properties or to anything that, that local governments regulate. Um, and then the other set, which I'll talk about just very briefly, is section a few provisions in section 6206, um, which govern the use of existing infrastructure for the National Public Safety Broadband Network. Um, moving on to that, um, just you know, very broad background here, the statute um, among many other things in this omnibus legislation, it establishes the first network respondent or authority, known for short as FirstNet. Um, and this is a unit within the NTIA, which in turn is within the Department of Commerce, um, sets, establishes this FirstNet as a nationwide licensee for a nationwide public safety broadband network. And there are many, many provisions of the Act associated with that. But among other things, um, there is a provision that the FirstNet shall use existing infrastructure for these public safety broadband facilities to the maximum extent economically desirable. Um, another provision directs the FirstNet to use partnerships with commercial providers to the maximum extent economically desirable. So those two seem to go together to a degree. Um, it also provides that FirstNet shall consult with state and local jurisdictions on facilities placement. Um, and this is, again, simplifying a bit. But, um, but th these three um, you know, small provisions work in the context of a fairly complicated statutory structure governing the FirstNet. So um, you know, taking these out of context sort of allied some of the questions about how this is all going to fit together. Um, the next step that the, um, that the statute sets up in the, um, in the process of establishing the first net is by, I believe, August 22nd is the date that NTIA has as a deadline to establish first net. And then there are certainly going to be other 
proceedings coming after that, but but for, for current purposes, just did want to lay out the background of those provisions. They will facilitate and encourage co-location opportunities for public safety, which um, and we'll be talking some more about public safety co-location later today. But you know, we think that's a very good thing, setting that framework. Okay, moving on then to to sort of the core issue here, Section 6409A. Um, And the basic provision there is that a state or local government may not deny and shall approve any application for a co-location that is within the scope of Section 6409A. So what is the scope of it? It applies to the co-location, removal, or modification of transmission equipment on a wireless tower or base station. That simple. So it does not apply to new tower construction. It does not apply to a co-location on a structure other than a wireless tower or base station, such as a building or a water tower. Um, It also does not apply if the action substantially changes the physical dimensions of the tower or base station. So there is a, a concept of limitation as to size, as to you know, so so that there are not major changes that, that could have you know you know major impacts that come under this provision. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about this substantial change because I think that's where there are some of the most questions and where there may be opportunities to look to history for for a bit of guidance as to exactly what that means. Um, The statute does not define the term. There there is no indication of what is meant by a substantial change in physical dimensions. But there is some law out there that, you know, that while there haven't been any formal interpretations, may provide some guidance in in interpreting this and and into what it might mean. And and that is the FCC's um, definition of substantial increase in size. This has its origins in the nationwide co-location agreement for historic preservation, um, which you can find in Part 1, Appendix B of the Commission's Rules, 47 CFR. Um, And what the nationwide co-location agreement does, basically, is that it excludes most co-locations that do not involve a substantial increase in size from review under Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. Um, The FCC, in conjunction with the Advisory Council of Historic Preservation and the National Conference of State Historic Preservation Officers, reached the determination that if a co-location meets these um, definitions, it's highly unlikely to have an adverse effect on historic properties and therefore was excluded from the review. Um, The FCC also then later used that same definition in the shot clock decision to define what is a co-location for purposes of the shot clock so that it comes within the 90-day time period rather than the 150-day period. And we said, with support from the commenters in that proceeding, that it really makes sense to to use that same definition, that, um, that again, it, it serves the same policy purposes. Um, so because of that, you know, we do think that it may be useful um, as guidance and p- as people are thinking about and as the courts may think about how to apply Section 6409. So what is the definition of substantial increase in size? Under the, under the nationwide co-location agreement, a substantial increase in size means any one of four things. First of all, an increase in the tower height by more than 10%, or by more than the height of adding an additional antenna array with 20 feet separation from any existing antenna, whichever is greater. So if it exceeds those limitations, it's a substantial increase in size. Second, if there are more than four new equipment cabinets or more than one new shelter being added, that would be a substantial increase. The third thing is if the new antenna um, protrudes more than 20 feet beyond the width of the tower or more than the width of the tower at the, at the height that, um, that it is being mounted, whichever is greater. Um, and the final thing is if there is excavation outside the existing leased or owned property and any current easements, then again you would have a substantial increase in size. Um, and you're going to be hearing more about the co-location agreement on our last panel this afternoon. There will, there's going to be some discussion about how that came about and, um, and how it has functioned. Um, 
just some quick notes about the administration of Section 6409A, how it fits into this existing statutory structure. Um, it takes precedence over Section 332C7 in the event of any conflict. The, the first words of that statutory provision are notwithstanding anything in Section 332C7. Um, however, to the extent that they can coexist, they do work together. So, um, so that the, the provisions in Section 332C7 that, that are not effectively rendered moot by the, by the new legislation are still effective. Um, and there is also a provision that it does not affect the FCC's responsibilities under the National Historic Preservation Act and under NEPA. So just some concluding thoughts here, um, just to, to review some of the key points. Co-locations on structures other than wireless towers and base stations remain subject solely to the existing law, that is Section 332C7 and, um, and the shot clock decision. Co-locations on wireless towers and base stations are subject to the new requirement, which is that the local government shall approve and may not deny the application. Um, and finally, just some, some basic thoughts on this. Um, you know, we're encouraging the governments and interested industry parties to work together on procedures you know, that are going to meet the statutory provision and satisfy both community and industry needs. You all have a lot of experience in this area where you know, we're not eager to, to step in and try to set prescriptive rules. We don't think that's the best way to go about this in the immediate term um, would certainly consider, you know, anything that may come up. But, um, but as a first instance, I think what we encourage is everybody to bring their experience. There's a lot of good work going out in the field already. I think it can be meshed with this new legislation and, and really hope that everybody tries in good faith. And that's what we're here today to try to, you know, help give maybe a little bit of encouragement if necessary to make that happen. Um, last slide here, I've just listed a few contact names, Dan and Don and myself. I think we're all good people to contact if, if folks have questions. Um, if you want to um, discuss anything about this, um, we're available. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so we're going to take a couple seconds just to ha get set up for the first panel. Um, if the three speakers could come up for the first panel. Um, th unless we have any questions. Or oh, do we have questions? Did we get any questions? Okay. Substantial increase and what the how that how that's worked over there in the in relation to the co-location agreement. Um, sure, I mean basically, you know, the, the co-location agreement was put in place in 2001, so there's been a lot of experience under that, and. Um, and essentially, I think the you know the substantial increase from from everything that we hear has um, has been a success. Um, we do not I, sure occasionally you know questions do come up of interpreting what it means um, that you know no no provision is going to be without issues. There there are some cases where you know there's a question: Is this a substantial increase? Isn't it? But they're they're fairly few and far between, at least that that come to the FCC's attention. And I've heard. You know, virtually no instances of somebody claiming, you know, this falls within the substantial increase, but um, but we really think it's an adverse effect, and and it has to be looked at. That's, um, you know, in in my experience, that's almost unheard of. So um, so I think from that perspective, um, we can reach the conclusion that that's been a success. Um, Nancy Shamu and um, and Bill Hackett are going to be talking about that further on the last panel this afternoon. Um, Nancy Shamu from the National Conference of Shippos and Bill from T-Mobile. So, um, you know, there are two perspectives on 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 how that the, the co-location agreement has functioned, um, and with a you know particular focus on this provision. So there'll be a chance for them to address it. Um, Later, and if, if their experience is different from from what I understand, they'll, they'll certainly correct me. But I, I don't expect that at all. 
John. That's fine. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. No more questions? All right. Thank you, Jeff. If we could now get the panelists for the first panel, Brian, Neil, and Ed, to come forward. So the first panel of the day will have um, three speakers. Uh, two of them will have pro- um, presentations, slide presentations. And uh, again, if you want to submit questions, if you're watching remotely, please send an email to livequestions at FCC.gov. If you're sitting here, just raise your hand, and one of the staff in the back will give you a note card and a pen for you to submit your questions. Please do it as soon as you think of it, um, instead of waiting till the end, because we may not have time to get to them if you wait till the very end. So the first panel will have two moderators. Dan Abeda is an assistant chief in the Spectrum Competition and Policy Division in the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau here at the FCC. And Don Johnson is an attorney in the same division with Dan. All right. Thank you. Cecilia. Just, uh, getting with all the legal issues aside and the introductions, I think we're ready to jump into the meat of what, what are co-locations. Our first uh, panel today will be looking at what are co-locations, why are they important, and what are the technical, structural, and other considerations that underlie their use with an emphasis on broadband. As Cecilia said, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the panel discussions. We do ask that when you ask your questions, please identify the uh, panelists that you would like to address the uh, question and the specific co-location issue that you're addressing. Brian Coyman, our first panelist, is the manager for wireless networks and site development at Sprint Network. Brian has 15 years of experience in the wireless industry managing infrastructure deployment programs. His current focus is on co-location support services and national lease management activities. Brian will be discussing business considerations in pursuing co-locations. Brian? Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. You're welcome. A little bit self-disclosure. I am one of those uh, people that carry more than one device. I actually have three. So... Mm -hmm. We got <laughs> Anyway, um, if we go to my slides real quick, I, I won't talk to uh, to my past history only because Dan's done a very good job of giving that. So, what I do want to talk about is, um, first of all, my goal today is really to provide a brief introduction to the audience today on what co-locations mean to wireless carriers. Um, I want to give you guys a little bit of background into why they're important to us, some of the business drivers, um, and I'll close with a little bit of an an anatomy of a cell site, give you some of the um, different components. So I want to talk a little bit and kick kick, kick us off with Spectrum, the discussion about Spectrum. I think that it's been a common discussion as of late and in uh, amongst our core group. Um, It's a finite resource to us. We look at it like um, the pipe through which communications happen. You think of it like a highway. It's a good analogy. You have so many lanes that you can actually force cars to go through. Once you start running out of um, of space to put those cars, you end up with traffic jams and you have a couple options. Either um, increase the number of lanes, which would be equivalent to adding more spectrum or 
building more roads, which would be equivalent to sites. So it's a good analogy that I, I use with my team and it seems to work in this instance. The talk a little bit about the growth in the smartphone and data devices. Um, had a good intro on that earlier. So those devices have definitely put a load on carriers' networks. It drives carriers to optimize their networks, change out equipment, deploy new equipment, rip and replace legacy uh, base stations. You'll um, see equipment upgrades and one of the uh, more interesting aspects is we're seeing a lot more microwave backhaul. Um, redu reduces our dependency on local exchange carriers for that, um, that pipe to get the, ca the traffic from the cell site back to the core. And um, you'll notice that in uh, future deployments, you'll see some more of the microwave um, deployments. I'll show you uh, as we go through this um, a photo or two of a microwave dish so that you can become familiar with what those those look like. Um, Sprint, as well as other carriers, we enter into agreements with large tower aggregators, rooftop management companies, um, teams that have access to these portfolios of attractive locations. Um, they offer us repeatable deployment processes, the speed to market, um, local expertise that helps with zoning and um, municipal discussions. Uh, carriers, just like most people, are they want, they want to provide a good quality service, but they also want to do it as easy as possible. They want to do it with um, as cheaply as possible, with as high, a as high quality as possible. So we try to strike that balance using um, these tower aggregators like SBA and Crown Castle and American Tower. So I've listed up here some of the benefits of those those tower aggregator companies. I'll move on to the next slide. A little bit of a eye chart here. You see some pictures at this point. You'll see panel antennas, microwave antennas, um, coax on a guide tower. What I'm talking about here is Sprint's next major project. It's, um, they call it Network Vision. It is um, Sprint's major program to prepare for the future in um, the wireless space. It, um, it's designed to replace the tower hardware with, uh, for multiple networks with uh, integrated multimodal um, equipment. What you're gonna end up seeing, the picture on the bottom the bottom left is going to be today's current installation where you have CDMA equipment, 4G equipment separate. Future state, you'll see all of that consolidated. It'll reduce the footprint. What you won't see in this picture is the way the signal actually reaches the antenna. Um, they're changing from a coax-based transmission line system to more fiber-fed. They're putting, we are putting um, remote radio heads, which we call RRHs, um, remote radio units. So you'll see more equipment going to the top of the tower rather than at the bottom of the tower. It does uh, reduce our demand for ground footprint, but we also have that space constraint on the tower top. There's not a lot of room to move once you get up in the air. So that's a challenge that the, the three of us have to deal with every day. What I've given you here is um, an anatomy of a, a co-location. This is what I'm showing are some pictures of tower tops. Um, the bottom right hand, bottom left hand side, you'll see remote radio heads, um, remote radio units. Basically, it's a s small box that replaces some of the equipment down at the base station at the bottom. Um, lines of coax and fiber going into those units. Um, this picture to the immediately to the right of that, it's a panel antenna. I think most of us are familiar with those. Another picture to the to the right of that, it's a panel antenna with a microwave dish directly below it. I wanted to point that out because those dishes are going to become more prevalent. 
um, just trying to move on listed the components of a tower the, uh, of a tower top you've got your antenna platforms you've got the mounts the antennas low noise amplifiers microwave dishes um, I've talked about remote radio units coax uh, transmission lines and I've listed both types there but as I've mentioned earlier they're changing to a more fiber distributed um, transmission and then you've got regular grounding and lightning protection so that's what we see at the top of the tower if we move to the next slide you have two examples of equipment on the ground um, we'll start with what's there to support the cabinetry you've got either a shelter a platform um, in some instances you'll, instances you'll have equipment on a slab or on um, a sled um, you'll have ice bridge protecting the cable and particularly in northern areas um, you have ice that if it falls off a tower it has an opportunity to um, damage the cable as it before it gets to the tower we want to minimize that so you see ice bridging um, backhaul cabinetry fiber microwave um, in hardening situations we'll, you'll see emergency generators installed at sites and fencing and screening as necessary my last slide I've provided some examples of co-location structures now I don't intend to have some of these structures listed or shown here to debate uh, definition of a co-located structure all I intend to, to put here is to list that we've got some opportunities and um, any uh, any structure out there of significant height is an opportunity for a wireless company to install antennas on but trying to bring closure to the site now or to the slides I'll list for you the different structure types as we call them in this picture you've got a monopole in the top left hand side going from left to right obviously a water tank I've given you a list uh, a picture of a smokestack on the smokestack you'll if you can see um, the lines the coax lines actually go up the outside of the smokestack and they're covered with a steel um, steel channel that's painted to match that that smokestack the last on the top it's you've got two self-supporting towers lattice towers one laden with microwave antennas the other um, there's some panel antennas at the top and omni antennas throughout on the lower left hand side that's actually a uh, grain silo with um, antennas mounted to it um, what you don't see there I believe the radio equipment's actually inside of the bottom of the that silo immediately to the, to the side of that you'll see a rooftop with panel antennas and um, again a microwave dish one of the more challenging installations we have um, electrical transmission lines um, a little bit difficult to get up among the high power lines so and at the very last you'll see a pretty tall bell tower <coughs> clock tower structure which is entirely stealth um, certainly not um, the most attractive from a cost standpoint but aesthetically it's one of the the options that we have out there with that um, I've given you a brief overview of what a co-location is for wireless carriers and um, I'll hand it off to my colleagues and once again I want to thank you for the invitation today thank you Brian our next panelist will discuss the structural considerations in the co-location process. Neil Kuplick is Vice President and Director of Structural Engineering Services for, for FDH Engineering Services. Neil is responsible for structural design and construction administration of telecommunications and other projects. Neil? Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, again, my name is Neil Kuplick. I'm a vice president with FDH Engineering. I'm registered in 31 states. I've got about 28 years of experience, which includes construction, design, and some forensic investigation. And as uh, part of FDH Engineering, we do approximately 400 tower analyses uh, per month. So we've seen many different towers, 
and we see a lot of them throughout the year. Um, telecommunication tower analysis and design is covered in each and every state or local building code. Uh, that code specifically uh, points out the uh, code for designing telecommunication towers, which is the uh, standard structural standards for antenna supporting structures and antennas. And that is called the TIA standard, TIA-222, and the most recent one is G. Um, that code gives us site-specific design data that we use to analyze each and every tower. Uh, this slide shows you, for example, uh, I showed the state code in green, which was the 2012 North Carolina Building Code. And then red, just below that in section 1609.1.1, I believe it is, it points out the TIA code, which we use to design and analyze the telecommunication towers. Uh, give you a, a the front slide or front uh, page of the TIA standard. Again, there's, uh, like many building codes, there's different iterations and, and revisions. The last one for the TA standards is, is Rev G, and that's used in right now about two thirds of the states in the U.S. Like I said, each location of the of the country, we have specific uh, design wind wind speeds that we follow that are laid out. You can see here it's in the southeast. Uh, not only do we go by the maps, but for the most part, we, we've got a design wind speed for each county. Um, part of our analysis is the, the antenna loads. We not only, we, we look at wind, for example, at uh, multiple directions at an antenna and going away from an antenna. So uh, uh, we've got a good idea what's going on with the antennas. Same with the microwave dishes. Uh, we look at it multiple directions. Uh, tower bracing, for example, you see on the slide, it's a self-support tower. Uh, we, we look at every member of the tower. The code tells us not only directions, uh, different load paths, uh, but each member, and as well as whether it's welded, bolted. So we look at not only the members, but the connections as well. Co-location process uh, for our company, we usually we receive a colo app from our client uh, requesting an analysis of a tower. Uh, we review the application, uh, the existing antennas, and the proposed antennas to go on the tower. We verify that we have the pertinent structural information on the tower. We model the tower in 3D and uh, review the results once they come out, and we provide our client with a report of our analyses on the tower. For example, this is uh, usually what we provide. You can see this one was uh, just a few days ago, and I believe it's a 300-foot guide tower. Uh, on the front page, we not only state the tower members, we give them maximum stress in any member on the tower. I believe this one's around 60%. That means uh, out of 100% capacity for the tower, the members of this tower, the maximum, were 60 percent. And we also uh, provide the analysis on the foundation. And we, load, we note that on the front page, and uh, this one, I believe, was about 50 percent. So with the loading on this tower, uh, the tower is sufficient, and we give the percentages of uh, capacity. Uh, as part of our analyses in our report, we give a profile of the tower. We show the type, for example, again, this is the 300-foot guide tower, list all the members. In the table, we show uh, all the appurtenances on the, the tower and the elevations. And we've got certain design notes that we, again, limit, or we note any design considerations we used. And again, at the very bottom, we list the tower capacity percentage as well. So we feel we are very experienced in every type of tower in the U.S. and abroad. Uh, we've seen a lot, analyzed a lot, and uh, very confident in our findings. So again, thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Neil.
Ed Roach is our third panelist. He's the Associate General Counsel for Regulatory Compliance at SBA Communications Corporation. SBA is the leading owner and operator of wireless infrastructure across North America. Ed is responsible for developing and administering SBA's compliance programs to ensure that SBA complies with all government regulations regarding tower siting. Ed will discuss the evolution of co-locations in the wireless industry and why it's so important to deliver state-of-the-art wireless services. Ed? Thanks, Dan. Um, Ed, I was going to tell you to move, mic- move yeah. your microphone close to you, but it's the first thing you did. Yeah, we I do have, have to speak loudly on. because it's on the, the web to make sure that everybody hears, but you already took care of that. Uh, okay. Check, check. Uh, okay, great. You can't fix it. Um, first, I wanted to thank the FCC Wireless Bureau and NATOA, Dan and Don, for setting this, up this workshop. I think any time we can get all the stakeholders in the industry together, uh, I always, it always, there's always a positive result. There's a lot of education and a lot of uh, problem solving that goes on. Um, I've been in the industry for about 15 years. Brian and I actually have been in about the same amount of time. And uh, I've sort of honed it down to two foundational principles, if you will, uh, over the years. And the first one is that as each day passes, people expect to do more with their wireless device for less money. Uh, you know, the days, years ago, people would be excited if they could get a phone call somewhere. Now, if they can't download some app or something, uh, some document, they get upset. So the expectation is very high. The second principle I've come up with is that as each day passes, it becomes more and more difficult to cite a new tower. Um, so when, those, when you put those two principles together, what, what ends up being critically important is co-location. That is maximizing... Uh, existing infrastructure to the point where we can deploy, uh, you know, state-of-the-art wireless uh, coverage. Um, I wanted to give a little history on the co-location because I started 15 years ago, and when I started, it was completely different. The industry was completely different in that uh, there were very few carriers involved, and those carriers that were involved, when they needed a site, what they would do is find their site, build a tower for themselves, at the location and height they needed, and that was it. There was never any, even any consideration at that point that someone else might go on that tower. And in fact, originally, it was seen as a competitive advantage. The, the carriers that were first to market didn't want to share their towers because they, they knew that the next entrant into the market was going to try to be providing and competing, providing the same coverage and competing in the same service. So what ended up happening is as the new entrants got there, they would get new sites, and then it turned out that one carrier, the original carrier, needed a site in that area, so they started doing tower swaps. After the tower swaps started developing, then zoning got a little more sophisticated, and they said, look, we don't want six towers in one town or four towers. Uh, we're going to mandate that you colo- allow for co-location on the towers. And that, along with the entrepreneurial spirit of our country, led to the infrastructure industry where people essentially built towers and uh, like SBA builds or buys towers and essentially our model is to rent them out to every carrier that uh, that is interested in that location. And that's really sort of the evolution and the maturation of this process and what it, what's what it's of the of the co-location industry and what it's allowed for it's allowed for speed to market where carriers new entrants new licensees when they get a license, can get into the market faster because they have opportunities to co-locate. In addition, uh, it cuts capital costs for carriers. They're not spending money hiring employees to develop towers. They're not spending money to go out and develop and design their own towers. They essentially just write it, find a site they need. They go through the paper, the the appropriate paperwork, co-locate on the site, and then all they have to do is pay rent, which, you know, we're very much in favor of. Um, in addition, co-location reduces new builds. Um, this is very important. It does not eliminate the need for new builds, but it reduces the need for them. Uh, you know, when you look and when you hear all the statistics that people will relay to you about uh, the wireless industry, you know, the talk is that you know, you know, the the voice trans the, the voice uh, uh, traffic has actually sort of plateaued. 
but when you hear what they talk about as far as projections for data, there's projections that, are th that data transmission on wireless devices will increase by 15 times over the next three years. It's just tremendous growth. So w what that means is you're going to need more sites uh, in order to, provi in order to uh, provide the coverage you need, you need to do. So co-location is, is going to be an essential part of that. Uh, my son was doing a project a few weeks ago, and they were doing that whole wants and needs evaluation. And the issue of a wireless device came up, and he said, oh, that's just a need. And none of the teachers disagreed. That's just <laughs> an essential element now. So I thought that kind of demonstrates just how far we've come. Um, I wanted to follow up because Brian mentioned how Spectrum is the foundation to providing wireless coverage. And uh, the way I look at infrastructure is infrastructure is sort of another block in that foundation. Uh, without the infrastructure necessary, all the spectrum in the world will do you no good. And when the bill, uh, when the bill was being considered up on the Hill, um, the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act, Jeff, I like your spectrum, uh, shortening to the spectrum bill better. But when, when, when we, we would visit the Hill to try to, you know, make our case that, the, you know, the co-location by right language was important. And the first thing we wanted to convince everybody is that, you know, when you hear spectrum on the Hill, they get sort of dollar signs in their eyes. They're trying to balance budgets. We can sell it. We can do this. But ultimately, if you don't have the necessary infrastructure in place, that spectrum's not going to be worth anything. So it was really important that we got that message across. Uh, a lot of people worked really hard to do that, and uh, we were successful in ha having that take place. So that's why that language is in the bill, and I think it will facilitate co-location uh, all throughout the United States. Uh, I had a, our company does, uh, we, have, we have a portfolio that includes towers in uh, a number of different countries, and I was actually asked by some government representatives from another country to, if I would speak with them. And they had recently had auctions, again, auctioning off, you know, licenses, and isn't it great? There's going to be more competition. Isn't this great? We're getting more m revenue for, 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 uh, to balance our budget. But they wanted me to sit down and try to explain to them, well, how did this happen? Well, how did you develop this infrastructure industry in your country? Because they're really at their – they have not evolved or matured in their wireless industry yet to the point where there's an infrastructure uh, component to it. So they have ca existing carriers who are refusing, essentially, to co allow co-location. They've just auctioned off for huge amounts of money all these licenses, and now the problem is that the competitiveness and the quality of coverage that they were hoping to achieve with these new licenses can't be done because of the, because of the fact that there is no infrastructure in industry. So that's just something that I think is going to develop over time. And again, there's a number of factors that influence that, but it all makes sense that you know, an infrastructure industry sort of develops and then allows for the deployment of the, of, of the wireless services. Um, I just want to address a little bit what Neil was talking about as far as structurals go. Um, you know, there, I've heard people express concerns that, well, if you own these towers, you know, your job is to maximize the use of the towers, and that's absolutely accurate. We want to get as many carriers on there because it's, it's the equivalent of having an apartment building. You want to have as many tenants as possible. But I think it's important to know that as a company, we've, we've worked hard, and I think really as an industry, we've worked really hard to develop a positive reputation with government agencies, with consumers, that we don't push the envelope to the point where safety is an issue or uh, we don't respect the environmental uh, regulations and, and the safety regulations. I think as an industry, we've worked really hard and we've done a great job working with the FCC to be compliant but also allow for an effective deployment of the uh, of the wireless uh, of the wireless communications. Um, we're a publicly traded company, so it's obviously in our best interest to make sure that you know when we put something on our tower, it's not going to collapse because there's too much equipment on it. We, that's just not the way we operate. Um, we, we're concerned about public safety. We're concerned about a reputation with our customers. Uh, our customers, uh, you know, expect that when they go on an SBA tower that we're going to be in compliant, that when we tell them that this tower is structurally sound, it is sound. Uh, we actually use FDH quite a bit. Uh, they do evaluations for us. So when people come, whether it's Sprint or any other carrier, they come to us, we, w on average, I'd say about 75% of our sites are, uh, unless they're new, th those are the usually generally the exception, 
75 percent of our sites generally are reviewed for at a bare minimum a structural opinion letter and that's to ensure that uh, the tower is safe for co-location and that uh, there's no issues regarding uh, deploying their services in that market so uh, that's about all I had Dan all right thank you Ed and I believe that we have some questions for our panelists. Don Johnson will ask the questions. All right. Sounds like it's on. Sounds like it's on. All right. Um, for, for Brian first. Uh, uh, one of the uh, questions that was, could you explain more the remote radio units and how those work and how those are um, – uh, how power, how those are powered? Um, I won't profess to be a, an, a, right. an equipment designer, but I, the radio heads essentially take um, transmit um, elements and remove them from the ground equipment and put them at the top of the tower. Um, the way they're powered is, um, I believe Corning makes a product that um, is a powered fiber line. It's a dual purpose. It's got a power conductor and fiber mm -hmm. um, within the same sheath. And um, we typically see replacement of the coax, the inch and five-eighths coax, which is around three-quarters of a pound a foot. So we would be taking rough between 1,500 and 2,000 pounds off the tower and replacing it with fiber lines, which would just estimating about a third of the weight. Um, so, I mean, that's how the power gets to those units. Um, hopefully that helps answer. I don't want to leave it as a no, no, magic no. black box. but Just so, to follow up on what you just said is that so uh, when you explain that going forward in the mobile broadband that it's fiber or, or, uh, or, or the um, high-speed microwave, um, it actually reduces – the low, it reduces the, the, the uh, I think I understand. The talk of, to talk about the equipment, um, the reason that, that they want to implement a fiber line and putting those radio heads to the, at the top of the tower, coax inherently, the, the legacy infrastructure, right. has a lot of power loss. Uh, okay. There's, um, think of... The, the further you get away, the, uh, you shout to somebody, the, the less you can hear. I mean, mm -hmm. the distance between two points, if they're talking, the lower the volume is. Um, so what we're trying to do is eliminate that and put those units up at the top of the tower and um, kind of remove that line loss from the equation. Uh, Great. And, and also, uh, could we, we uh, always, you know, discuss siting from, you know, a, a lot of people from the coverage, but also the capacity. <coughs> to, you know, how important capacity is to carriers. Capacity is critically important. Um, I mean, what we we end up putting additional elements at each location to increase its capacity over time, but we know that there's a uh, a top end threshold of how much equipment we could put at a location and um, still achieve uh, a, an acceptable level of quality with that customer. Um, we, we essentially, I mean, what we at Sprint call those, we call those carriers. I don't want it to get confusing with, you know, wireless carriers in the industry, but um, we deploy additional elements for each site. So each one of those elements or carrier um, is an incremental um, mm -hmm. capacity uh, unit. Think of it like, um, you know, a megabyte. Or if you're talking about a computer, you've got a certain amount of capacity. You can add another hard drive, another hard drive. But at some point, you can't add any more because you, you don't have enough resources for it to, to transmit over. Right. Okay. Uh, for for Neil, uh, just uh, going through the the process and uh, with uh, what is, on the structural side, what is the kind of in interaction with the local local 
either zoning board or government body that's uh, approving and uh, you know approving the co-location and what happens when either a local government official or um, or someone in the at the hearing raises structural issues? Um, we uh, when we get the the application, typically we'll we'll call the uh, local jurisdiction to verify. The main thing for us is wind loading. Uh, on the towers, the antennas are like sails on a ship. So the more you have, the bigger you have, the more it'll stress the tower. So their primary concern is, is the tower safe? Are we using the correct loading on the tower? So we'll, in turn, we'll run the analysis. Uh, and uh, once we have it, we review it and give it to our clients. So a lot of times the, it's the next step will be then the, our client will take it to the local jurisdiction to get a building permit. Uh, and that's where I think Ed would come in. And if, the, if they have any concerns in the permitting, they'll either contact us directly or we'll hear back. But usually it's, uh, uh, do we use a correct code? Oftentimes they aren't aware that there's a specific code for towers. So uh, and a lot of times we are educating them to say, like I had on the slide, here's your state building code, here's the exception that says all these towers must be designed per this specific code and uh, go through our, our loading and show where we came up. So on the structural side, usually we don't have a problem. Uh, there are some jurisdictions that use other firms uh, to review our, our work, which is, which is good. And uh, they'll often raise questions and we, we just provide them whatever information or data or calculations that they need. Great. Um, and, um, and Fred, uh, what, it's a lot of expansion in the, um, you know, in the 4G uh, LTE area. Um, how does uh, an SBA see that as in the as it grows further out in the suburban and rural areas? Uh, in the you know how important are co-locations in, in those markets? I mean it, it's it's critical. I mean like I said earlier, the spectrum of the technology is great. You know everybody likes to show off their phone. Everybody likes to talk about spectrum, but if you can't deliver it, you know that's really ultimately the challenge. So there's advances in technology year after year. But essentially, you need to, and especially one thing is when you're talking about, I, I mentioned earlier that there's a lot more data transmission. Everybody recognizes that. And what happens is data transmission generally requires more sites, closer sites to provide, you know, uh, sort of better coverage, if you will. So I know Brian is probably faces that. That's, that's his job is essentially to deal with that challenge on a daily basis. And without the ability to co-locate, uh, you know, it, it just wouldn't it wouldn't roll out nearly as fast, or it may not be able to roll out effectively. Uh, and what are the uh, what is the uh, the rough average of number of co-locators on a typical SBA tower? That's a good question. It's going to depend on the tower, but I would probably say I mean we you know from there's towers within the industry that have you know there's one a site we have in uh, I believe it's in Long Island that has over 50 co-locators on the site. Okay, uh, we have other sites that are you know smaller and don't accept. I would say on average, it's probably the towers would would uh, in the industry wide, I'd say five or six co-locators. Neil, you know, does, that, does that sound yeah. about right? Yes. And uh, last, and you do you co-locate both commercial and public safety? Um, we do not discriminate against, against co-locators. <laughs> we, we we essentially uh, our business model is to cash rent checks. Mm -hmm. So we basically. I will say though, in all honesty, that w I get calls. I'm on the FCC registration for all of our towers, so I get a, I get a number of emails and calls every day. But I do get calls from volunteer fire departments. I do get calls from local uh, EMT folks. You know, especially in the rural areas, who say, "Hey, we could really use something like that." And Honestly, we try to work with them as best we can. You know, some, th these are not uh, organizations flush with cash. So, but we we aggressively market to commercial, and we we, we aggressively market our towers to everybody, essentially. 
Um, and here is a question about regarding um, uh, backup power in a multi-tenant, I guess for Ed here, in a multi-tenant uh, co-location co situation, uh, typically who provides the backup power for the tenants? Um, is that the tower owner or each tenant, or how, do, how is that set, set up? I, I think it's a site-by-site -site issue. Um, okay. I mean, Brian can answer this from Sprint's perspective, but gener I think overall I would probably say most of the time it's the carriers that provide some level of backup for themselves. That, that, would, that would be accurate. I mean, generally speaking, the carrier is going to know how critical one site is versus another one. So we wouldn't expect SBA to know that and, and, and put the infrastructure at all other sites just anticipating um, demand. So most of the time you're going to see a carrier install a generator. Time to time, from time to time you will see when hurricane prone areas, mm -hmm. um, SBA will basically talk with all of the um, carriers and say, hey, we want, we want okay. a generator or a backup power at the site and they'll all. Um, and, and sometimes it actually dovetails into the co-location issue because if everybody has their own backup power, that takes up more space. If you provide one central generator to ba provide backup power for not only the carriers but also the tower, you know, the tower lighting, then you eliminate the need for to, to sort of use up too much space within the tower compound. Um, and um, it's been discussion has uh, uh, brought up about the, the statute and sub the substantial increase. And um, can you? Uh, sort of give uh, SBA's perspective on how the co-location agreement has worked um, with all of the 50 state historic preservation offices. Uh, we've had a very positive experience with it. I mean, uh, it's really facilitated co-location. It's, I think, the SHPO offices welcomed it because it dramatically worked. I mean, you know, I remember the first time Shippo came up and somebody said, I said to somebody, look, we've got a Shippo issue on the, and, and he said, well, can't you have that removed? You know, I mean, it's, people didn't even understand what it was. Right. And you have to really take into consideration that a lot of these Shippo Shippo officers are very small, uh, usually underfunded, understaffed. Uh, they do a tremendous job. And I think, again, I would go back, not just SBA, but we as an industry have worked very well with the Shippos. And that's been facilitated by the FCC, where we've developed this relationship. And honestly, I, w I concur with what Jeff said earlier, which he said, you know, there really hasn't, we really haven't run into many issues at all with the substantial increase in height. It's, it's really worked seamlessly. And, and in fact, can, would you, can you explain what SBA does looking at what's very important to most communities, the, lo the um, historic preservation character of the communities? Well, again, we, we, we make sure we comply with all the laws. We can we put a, put out public notice. We consult with the SHPO. We consult with uh, a, a, anyone that needs to be consulted with regarding the historic properties, and obviously the sites go through zoning. But again, we look at it like, um, you know, we, you know, one of the developments was during over, over, the, over time from the tower industry was the zoning jurisdiction started to mandate co-location. And as an infrastructure provider, you kind of laugh. It's like somebody saying, we're going to approve this McDonald's on the corner of Main Street, but you have to, assure, you have to guarantee us that you're going to sell hamburgers there. I mean, that's, what, that's our model. We want to lease it out. So, um, but from a historic properties perspective, co-location is a huge advantage, where you may have had four individual towers 20, 20 30, maybe 20, 25 years ago. Now you have one tower. And uh, you've got all the tenants there, and it, it dramatically reduces the overall impact. And, um, and uh, for Brian, so uh, um, when you see going back to the capacity question, just to, uh, to explain what that means to uh, the audience uh, regarding, um, you know. The dream of smartphones and mm -hmm. i and tablets, et cetera, and w you know why it's so necessary to ha to uh, increase co-locations. Well, to necessary to increase co-locations. Um, we we've kind of covered that 
the capacity in individual cell sites kind of constrained. You can right. install more sites in, in an area or you can add spectrum. But um, why is co-location important? Well, you going to see more users of these devices like myself where they have two, maybe three of them. Um, as, as Ed had mentioned, they're going to have an increased expectation for quality. It's like McDonald's. I mean, it's a good analogy. They don't want to be on a phone at an airport and then as two hours later when they're at a meeting off of airport property, they, they don't want to have a difference in quality. So they want that coverage ubiquitous. Um, why is it important for us? Because we want to provide that that seamless coverage. We want to provide that consistent quality that that looks the same everywhere um, for a relatively um, stable economic standpoint. We don't. We we want to. We don't want to. How do, I, how do I say this? You want you want to balance cost, quality, and um, and speed to market. And and the best way for us to do that is on co-locatable structures. Um, we've we've got teams of, of people within companies like SBA that already are familiar with the local regulations, already familiar with local municipalities that can get us in those markets faster. Um, from a cost standpoint, it's cheaper for us because we don't have to invest in that uh, capital cost of new steel in the air. Um, and the the only the deviating factor there is quality. I mean, the, the site's already there, so we've got to make sure that it meshes well with it inside the current network, um, and we optimize sites. All, um, when I say optimize, what I mean is we will change the orientation of antennas, tweak surrounding sites to try to make those co-locations work um, better or those sites work better with that proposed co-location. So hopefully um, I've explained from Sprint's perspective why a co-location is important as we add new sites or as we um, add um, elements into the network. And for, for Neil, we receive uh, questions over the phone, and I certainly, and our staff, we're a bunch of lawyers, so, but uh, false own questions, or, and, and, uh, you know, and, you know, and, uh, you know, the tower's going to collapse, or something like that, and, and, uh, and, and, uh, we, we, we certainly can explain, but, you know, the, what, what is the kind of assurance factor that, uh, Well, as you, as you can see on the report I had up there, my name and my seal is on the analysis. Mm -hmm. I like to sleep pretty well at night, so I want to make sure it won't fall down. Uh, inherent in construction, uh, well, inherent in steel design, concrete design, you have factors of safety. So we also have factors of safety in our wind loads, seismic loads, or earthquake loads. So on the tower analysis report that I put up, the uh, tower components were, I believe, low 60%. In fact, if you take out or look at the factors of safety, that's actually probably less than 30, maybe 25% of the capacity of that tower. So when we run our analyses, again, it's very well scripted. We, we know the ice load, wind load, all that kind of loading uh, it, it's put in there so we we feel when we say that tower is safe or that tower has capacity to support those the co-location going on uh, um, it, it's a very safe design and, and we know it will not come down I think with all even all the tornadoes and, and such that have gone through the US recently uh, I think you guys know very few towers have come down unless they were in the direct path of the tornado. And many times that's because of all the debris that's flying around if, that gets caught in the tower and gives it even more area to, to knock it down. And oftentimes those uh, uh, catastrophes and high wind loads are much more than the design wind loads. So after we analyze it, 
I feel very confident saying our analysis is uh, accurate and those towers are very safe. Uh, for Brian, uh, following up on what you said, uh, how does a co-location allow for new providers and increased competition? Uh, what's the cost of a new tower versus a co-location for the, for the carrier? Um, in general. In, in general, not including the, the common equipment, right. um, a new tower could cost up to three times as much as uh, attaching to an existing structure. Um, I mean, working in that industry as well, I mean, just attaching to an existing tower, construction costs, we're talking around fifty to $75,000, and if you're putting new steel in, in the air, you're talking substantially more than that, $250,000, $300,000. Um, and that doesn't include the, the electronics that, that you would put at the site and, or the other common equipment. And I think that's an interesting point because many times, or I won't say many times, but there are certain uh, consultants that work in the industry that will claim that a carry doesn't actually need a site, that they just want to go on here. I'm not sure what the rationale behind that is, but that they just mm -hmm. decided that they woke up one night and wanted to go, woke, woke up one morning and said, hey, I want to go on that site. The reality is it's a reduced capital cost for the carriers to co-locate on a site, but it is still a substantial cost to co-locate onto a tower. And they don't do that just because they think it's a, you know, they do it because they want to imp improve their capacity and their coverage. There's just, there's, there's no, lo there's really no logic in the argument that the carriers don't really have a need for it. If they're, I look at it, if they're willing to spend the money, then they have a need. And which fits in with the, the smartphone and tablet growth, that uh, high-speed tablet growth. No, no. Uh, thanks, uh, Brian, Neil, and Ed. Thank you for your informative presentations. Great. Thanks. So we're going to take a break for lunch, and we've scheduled, um, the agenda says come back at um, 1 o'clock. We're going to try ask people to be back about quarter of 1. If you want to go um, eat, in, we have a cafeteria downstairs on the courtyard level. If you want to do that, we're going to have a couple of FCC staff in the back to take you down because you have to be escorted through the building. Um, if, uh, could all the speakers come up here, though, real quick? Um, before we go out to lunch. Uh, you will have to go back through the security screening. Uh, you won't have to show your ID or anything like that. They'll let you keep your white badges. If you don't want to eat here in the building, if you go out the front of the building and go to the left um, at the next cross street, there's a Starbucks and there's also a little deli on the corner there. Um, but we're asking people to be back here by 1145. So if all the speakers could come up here and anybody else that wants to... Um, Go to lunch. Just look for some FCC staff in the back to take you down to the cafeteria if you want to go. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I'd like to remind everybody um, we're going to have a brief presentation and then have two, um, two more panels this afternoon. So for those of you watching remotely on the web, you can submit questions by sending an email to livequestions at FCC.gov, those of you here in the room can send any, uh, can write your uh, questions on note cards and we'll have staff with note cards and pens for you. We'll collect up the questions from you. Um, please include your name, the company you're affiliated with, and if your question is for a specific panelist or speaker, put that in there as well if you would. We're going to start the afternoon off with some brief remarks from Jane Jackson who spoke at the beginning of the day.
Thanks, Cecilia. Um, hope everybody had a great morning session. I uh, hope you managed to negotiate our sadly limited lunch opportunities in this particular corner of the nation's capital and that you learned a lot and I'm happy to welcome you back for what looks like a really full and interesting afternoon. Our first panel this afternoon will discuss opportunities for co-locating wireless antennas on various types of towers and structures, including public safety towers, AM radio towers, and utility structures. The second panel will present some examples of how state, local, and federal processes have helped enable co-locations to the benefit of communities. But before we get underway, I would like to extend some special recognition to one county that has been a pioneer in attracting commercial co-locations to public safety towers. Hanover County is a mostly rural county located north of Richmond, Virginia. Phil Hines, the former director of Hanover County's Emergency Communications Department, is our first panelist this afternoon. And in just a minute, he will tell you about the county's program. What makes Hanover County special is that as a result of planning and foresight, commercial wireless antennas are now co-located on more than a dozen public safety towers throughout the county. Through these co-locations, 4G mobile broadband has come to some of the county's most remote areas. Hanover County also, of course, receives revenue from the co-locating carrier, and this helps maintain the public safety system. Mr. Bill Perry, the current operations manager of the county's emergency communications department, is also with us today. So I'd like to invite Mr. Hines and Mr. Perry to come up to the dais and be recognized for the county's leadership in providing, in developing public-private partnership that is helping meet the twin goals of public safety coverage and mobile broadband for residents of rural areas. It's a photo up. Thank you. So now we'd like to invite the panelists for panel number two to come forward and sit behind your name. <laughs> the second panel this afternoon, as Jane said, will be on co-location on non-traditional towers and other structures. Uh, we will have two moderators for this panel, so each panelist will have a brief presentation, um, and then there will be time for questions and answers afterward. The moderators for this panel will again be Dan Abeda and Don Johnson, who are from our Spectrum Competition and Policy Division in the Wireless Bureau here at the FCC. Thank you, Cecilia. And as Jane indicated, our first panelist will be Phil Hines, and Phil will be discussing co-locations on public safety towers at the county level. Phil? Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Phil Hines, a uh, retired director of the communications department for Hanover County. What I'd like to do today is give you a brief update on what we've done in the county to uh, solicitate our uh, public safety system and to encourage the commercial providers to work with us uh, as far as sharing tower space. Slides. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. 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 I'm sorry. Okay. Hanover County uh, is a mainly rural county located uh, approximately 20 miles north of the capital city of uh, Richmond. Uh, it's approximately 400, 471 square miles with a population of about 102,000. It's the home place to Patrick Henry and Henry Clay, but it also has its suburban venues such as King's Dominion and the Richmond news, newspaper headquarters. In April of 2010, uh, the Emergency Communications Department cut over to a new uh, communications system. It's a P25 system with 15 sites and 12 channels. This replaced a four-site, 10-channel, 800 megahertz system analog that we installed in 1992. This is relevant because of the towers that had, the 15 towers that were needed for the new system. Uh, we wanted to share them or uh, have the commercial use of those shared on those towers. The 15 towers that we used uh, we u reused the four that were commercial, that were put in for the 1992 system. Uh, one of those, uh, three of those were transmit sites. One of them was simply a microwave site. We also leased on commercial uh, sites uh, one that was constructed while we were constructing our towers. That left us having to build nine sites. One thing that worked out well for us, we had a commercial vendor that needed a site in the same place that, that the county needed theirs. They agreed to build the site for Hanover County for the rights to the 15, top 50 foot of the tower. So they actually built one and just deeded it over to the county. The county towers range from 300 to 450 foot. The, tower, the lots we built a uh, minimum of 70 by 70 and as much as 100 by 100. Uh, this was to uh, assure that we had enough space uh, for any co-locators to be within the compound, the security compound of our sites. Uh, the towers consist of both self-support and in guy, and the towers, with the exception of one, are on county-owned property. All the all the towers were constructed uh, to handle the county's current needs, the new system. Any future needs that the county may have, as far as expansion of channels or expansion of, of communication system needs and to accommodate up to five uh, commercial co-locations. Uh, depending on the height of the tower, we got some with four and some with five. Currently, we have 16 commercial installations on eight of our 15 towers. Uh, the providers are Sprint, AT&T, Verizon, and Intellos. Uh, that's generating about a quarter million dollars revenue for the county on those installations. Why did the county take this type of approach? We wanted to limit the number of towers in the county. At the same time, we wanted uh, to provide the public safety and commercial communication service. Uh, doing it on the same towers made sense to us. Uh, we knew that it would generate uh, revenue uh, if we got enough co-locators where it would assist us not only with the cost of the initial system, but the ongoing tower and system uh, maintenance fees. 
the doing it this way the county also maintain control over sites so that's probably one of the big uh, hang ups with public safety and commercial is control of the sites and as long as the county can control uh, the activities at the sites it made sense to do it the county approached uh, about sharing the tower space we advertised uh, naturally we got the one vendor to build the actual site for us uh, then we handled the co-locations on first come first serve basis we made it plain that we were going to set the rules and the rates ahead of time and uh, we would follow that up in the lease agreements uh, we by co-locating we uh, help the commercial providers by minimizing the planning requirements normally they'd have to do a, a site plan amendment or a site plan uh, to get a tower in as long as they co-located and didn't go outside of the compound there was no site plan required uh, the big thing we do not share any space in the shelter all the county owned public safety uh, shelter space is solely for the county. And we built the uh, shelters, <coughs> built the compounds large enough to accommodate the shelters and racks and so forth that the commercial providers would need. We limited the number of towers needed in the county. We saved the commercial providers money and time by not having to do all the planning requirements. Uh, it provided the county with revenue. It allowed public safety to maintain control over the towers. And the county benefits from the commercial providers' uh, copper and fiber that they put in at the sites. Over the past several months, uh, one of the commercial uh, providers has begun upgrading uh, to put in the broadband technology at these sites as well, in a predominantly in, at sites that are in a predominantly rural environment. So, I think we we took a big step in the right direction, and in uh, public safety uh, private partnership. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. <clears throat> Monica Gambino, our second panelist, is a vice president for legal affairs at Crown Castle USA, Inc., a leading provider of wireless infrastructure in the United States and abroad. Monica will discuss co-locations on public safety towers at the state level. Is working? Yep. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Thank you for inviting me here today. Um, as, as always, these forms are very informative and very important, I think, to the community and to the service providers. Um, as Dan said, I'm Monica Gambino. I'm the Vice President of Legal at Crown Castle. I'm marking my 11th year at Crown Castle, and as Ed Roach remarked earlier this morning, I have two witnessed remarkable growth in the wireless industry. When I began at Crown Castle, we were building and acquiring towers at a breakneck speed. Today, we're all about co-location, and not only in towers. I have been asked to speak about the co-location and public safety because Crown Castle has had the unique opportunity to work with the state of New York for the last 14 years as its manager of telecommunication, telecommunication sites. Um, the agreement that we have with the state of New York includes all structures owned by the state of New York, including towers, buildings, water tanks, rooftops, and right-of-ways. The state of New York had a lot of foresight 
Envision back in 1997 when it decided to work with a third party uh, tower company to manage its telecommunications assets. Um, Crown Castle, as I said, markets the sites, we engineer the sites, we develop, manage, and license services to the state for state owned structures, rooftops, and other properties. The state realized back in 1997 that it, it wasn't in the business of um, leasing space on its tower sites and other structures and uh, sought out a company that could provide the professional service to do these matters. Through the leadership of the New York State Police Department, we have worked together to have a very successful relationship to date. Since 1997, Crown has co-located co over 1,250 antennas on all, of all wireless providers and has developed 72 wireless infrastructure sites, including 27 new state-owned towers. These state-owned towers um, were built without any funds from the uh, state of New York. They were all built through Crown Castle and through its relationships with the other carriers. The benefits that the state of New York has reaped are great. Since the, the onset of this agreement, um, the state of New York has generated, through this arrangement, tens of millions of dollars of revenue. Uh, in additional straight state infrastructure resources for public safety have been provided, both for public communications purposes and for the state police purposes. As a result, this is really a win-win-win situation as far as we're concerned and I think um, the parties involved. The state received additional infrastructure for use in public safety at no state dollars. The people of New York received improved wireless service the carriers that co-located on these facilities had additional facilities that were otherwise unavailable. And in addition, they had the certainty of working with a known tower company that could do a lot of the legwork to get on these towers. At a time when state and local budgets are constrained, and there are reports every day of communities questioning how they can provide radios for their public safety and other, um, other uh, entities in their local governments. Um, there's no question that the use of, of public safety towers and, and other infrastructure can help complement the budget uh, for those states and other entities. At the same time, there is an increased need, as we've all heard today, for coverage and capacity. So opening up the state, county, and municipal structures is an elegant and economic solution. Thank you. Thanks, Monica. <clears throat> but Monica has double duty with oh, us today. I do. I'm passing you the thing already. <laughs> since Monica is also going to be discussing rooftop co-locations. That's right. Thank you, Dan, for reminding me. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> for my slides. So it only makes sense to um, continue this discussion of rooftops. Uh, it was a good segue from the state of New York discussion because as I said there were lots of rooftops in the state of New York uh, portfolio that we manage. Um, certainly, certainly, uh, let's see, I have to go one more? Okay. Certainly rooftops are critical to the uh, wireless broadband uh, acceleration with respect to urban and suburban markets. Rooftops, however, have always historically been a part of the wireless operator network. Um, the evolution of wireless network design, though, is trending much more towards more sites and at lower elevations. So rooftops are, again, back in the, the, one of the key elements of, of your network. Um, and they're ideal for the urban and suburban locations. The problem is rooftop, rooftops have never been traditionally easy for co-location, and there's many reasons why. Um, the first reason is that often it's, it's difficult to identify a rooftop with a willing building owner who wants to actually co-locate uh, antennas on that rooftop. Secondly, once you find that 
it's often difficult to contract with that building owner. Um, oftentimes, the building owners are used to leasing commercial leases, office space, other commercial space, not necessarily wireless licenses on rooftops. Um, once you pass that, again, sometimes access is difficult. Our wireless customers and carriers are, are typically interested in need 24-7 access to rooftops. This is not often the case in buildings that have high security, that are locked up at night, that uh, are uh, where you have to go through a metal detector to get in. So it can be difficult to co-locate on a rooftop. Sometimes also the age of the building has an effect on co-locating rooftops. Um, certainly a lot of us know that age plays a role with some of the regulations of the FCC. Uh, any rooftop that, any building that's 45 years um, old or more would have to have ship by review. Um, sometimes a building can actually be a historic landmark or be in proximity to historic landmarks. So there are challenges with rooftops. Oftentimes there's environmental hurdles depending upon the age of the building and what might be located within that building. Um, and finally, with respect to rooftops, there's still siting challenges. Um, in some locations, it's possible to co-locate on a roof with ease, but in other locations, it's as difficult as building a tower. Um, some of this doesn't really make sense anymore, especially in light of the co-location legislation that was passed. Um, but when you look at it now, co-location by right may give the advantage to, um, to, the roof, to the tower over the rooftop if there's a choice because of the other difficulties with rooftops. However, it doesn't mean that rooftops should be counted out. So as a tower company, um, our mantra has was co-location on towers, our new mantra, obviously, and I think that of many others is we will help our customers co-locate where they need to go. And certainly rooftops is one of those places. So over the past several years, we've been obtaining um, <clears throat> opportunities at lots of rooftops, thousands of rooftops across the country. The reason that we do this is so that we can do some of the legwork and the sort of the make ready work ahead of the customer. Uh, we can negotiate contracts ahead of the customer and so that they are uh, not faced with negotiating those at each particular uh, rooftop on their own. We can manage the carrier's installation. We can maintain the integrity and the compliance of the building and the rooftop. Um, equipment rarely takes up much space on the building occupancy, but we can make sure that that equipment is located where it makes sense to locate it, both uh, environmentally and from an aesthetic point of view. Uh, carriers who seek uh, actively seeking rooftop space or seeking it for coverage and capacity and we can help those building owners identify carriers that are, uh, are interested in that part of town. Crown has um, throughout the years developed its own proprietary software system where we can go out and actually do some testing to see what buildings and what parts of the town might be necessary or good opportunities for antenna locations. We tried to build our our portfolio around those facilities so that we can help our customers in any way possible. But we do maintain the site integrity of the building and I think this is often an issue because um, building owners may be concerned that once uh, they start leasing space to an antenna, uh, to a carrier to place antennas, that they may lose control over that rooftop. And so we believe that it makes sense to have a company like Crown or another tower company or another company that's in this business help manage those sites. It, it, it allows for speed to market. Um, we can watch and make sure that the equipment is installed appropriately. We can make sure that there's no damage to the rooftops uh, and we can do inspections of those rooftops. And finally, as, as many of you know, some rooftops have to be monitored. They require lighting depending upon what type of antenna and how tall it is and what else might be on the roof. Um, we have a network operations center that staff set 24-7 that can help provide that to our customers and to the building owners. So um, in, uh, in a nutshell, we think that rooftops are, are certainly a very viable uh, option for co-location. Uh, 
certainly any structure nowadays is a viable option and will probably be used for co-location. But we believe there's a few things that we could do moving forward that might even help. Um, we look forward to working with the FCC on some historic preservation issues concerning um, Section 106 and the uh, processes at the rooftops. We're hoping to maybe find uh, some clarity in some of the provisions of the, the co-location uh, programmatic agreement that covers the rooftop areas specifically, how we can maybe work with like-for-like uh, -like replacements on rooftops, uh, ha what happens if a uh, antenna is added that's not visible from the ground, what about buildings that are stealth? Can we use? Uh, can we work with some? Uh, can we make some options available that don't have to require SHPO approval in each time? We'd also like to work with NATOA to look at some of the issues related to um, actually siting and permitting antennas on rooftops. Um, as I said, in some communities, it's a very streamlined and easy process. In other communities, it can be very difficult. Hopefully, we can work together to identify those best practices that are, uh, are available for rooftops and try to actually implement some um, more acceleration in the broadband acceleration plan when it comes to rooftops. Thank you. Thanks again. <laughs> now I'm done. Thanks again, Monica. Um, our next two panelists will discuss the innovative approach of co-locations on hot AM radio towers. Chris Horn is the Chief Technical Officer for LBA Group, Inc. Chris will discuss the technical considerations and how to co-locate wireless antennas and their existing base stations on or near AM towers. Our next panelist, and I'll introduce him now, John Trent is the President of the law firm of Pud Brees, Hunsaker, and Trent. John will discuss the win-win factors when using AM towers in rural areas for wireless broadband co-locations. Chris, we'll start off with you. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to um, uh, come to speak today uh, regarding the use of AM towers for uh, co-location. Um, the goal of my presentation is to make you aware of AM towers as a structure for co-location. Um, I like uh, Ed Roach's comment, <clears throat> Ed Roach of SBA, who said that any structure is an opportunity for co-location as we seek to uh, accelerate a broadband uh, in this country. Um, and as uh, we said uh, earlier when we had a presentation on this, um, AM towers and the co-location technology is actually shovel-ready, uh, to steal a phrase from uh, our president. Um, right now, uh, there are somewhere between 100,000 and 125,000 uh, towers in the United States, and about 10,000 of those are AM towers. Among the 10,000 AM towers, approximately 1% of those are being utilized with uh, AM co-location technology uh, for wireless antennas and broadband antennas uh, and, the, and the like. Uh, so the AM towers is an opportunity for co-location. Um, I like to think of the AM tower as kind of a, a forgotten infrastructure. Uh, many of us don't think about AM. Many of us now don't listen to AM. Um, I do listen to AM because I got my first uh, start in wireless uh, visiting an AM station uh, in, in the late 70s and um, was very fascinated with AM towers and then uh, sometime soon after cellular came along, cellular radio. But there's a stark difference between the two. Um, most notably is that um, AM towers are hot that is, they, they are energized with a, a, a power that is um, ten, or 10 times what you would have from a, a cellular a base station. And um, so they are different, uh, different physics, but, um, or excuse me, same physics, but different infrastructure. Uh, we like to say that AM towers and wireless 
are 100 years and 1,000 megahertz apart. Um, AM radio is, is about one megahertz, and cellular technology is about 1,000 megahertz. Um, the good news is um, there is isolation. What do I mean by isolation? I mean what we're trying to do is isolate the wireless base station from the AM tower. And that technology exists today. It actually has been around uh, for some time. Uh, the company I work for, LBA, has proprietary uh, equipment that can be used uh, for AM co-location. Uh, the two photos here are taken in a downtown city in the United States. Uh, on the far right-hand side is a rooftop AM tower. You don't see too many of those. There's one in Silver Spring, Maryland. There's, this one is in High Point, North Carolina. And on the far left is a co-located um, lattice tower also on top of a building, and they're about, uh, about 2,000 feet apart. Um, so you can see that the proliferation of the wireless antennas on one tower and not anything on the other tower except an FM antenna. The FM antenna is also isolated from the AM antenna. Uh, AM towers, um, ripe for the picking. Um, that could be an overstatement. Again, AM towers is an opportunity for co-location. It doesn't mean every single one of them uh, will meet the coverage needs, will be structurally sound. Uh, there are several, several items that need to be considered, but that is my point. Uh, the site acquisition specialist, when they're driving around or looking for a search ring, should not shy away from AM towers because they are hot or historically um, RF engineers at wireless companies stayed away from AM towers because of um, something called detuning. Um, again, they can be used and they should be considered uh, for AM co-location. On the far left is a non-directional single tower AM structure. In the middle is a three tower array for a directional antenna system. And uh, on, the, on the far right hand side is a four tower AM array. Those towers are self-supporting. They're about 300 feet tall out in um, Illinois. Uh, there are a number of issues um, that go along with uh, AM co-location as far as uh, the culture be behind the 1920s uh, technology when AM radio started. Uh, it was in its heyday in the 60s and 70s and is now um, uh, a mixed bag, I guess. There are a number of markets um, in the United States, New York City, Washington, D.C., that um, the AM stations uh, are thriving economically, but a lot of mom-and-pop stations out there that are not thriving um, and would be willing to work with um, companies like Crown and SBA for um, co-location. Um, again, AM and wireless are regulated under different bureaus, uh, the mass media and then the WTB. Um, there's cultural differences. There's knowledge differences uh, between the two. And um, I'm going to enlighten you a little bit on that, but I see the time is really getting down here. So I'm going to speed up a little bit. Um, a major source of revenue for AM stations, yes. Uh, the benefits, um, as far as a tower company, if you compare a greenfield site with an AM co-location, there is a significant or can be a significant CapEx budget advantage. Yes, that's true. Um, an income stream for the AM station. And again, there are thousands of unused sites and uh, properties available out there to, to be considered. How do you implement the uh, AM co-location uh, system? Um, again, AM towers are hot. I don't mean really, really high voltages, but I mean one has to be careful around AM towers because of the power is 1,000 watts or 10,000 watts or whatever versus the wireless base station you're dealing with 100 watts. So there's a difference in power and RF issues. Uh, fortunately, uh, co-location technology can be uh, installed so that there is uh, not a safety issue for the wireless technician, uh, the site tech. And um, again, a, a key issue is that there is no FCC requirement to, to be authorized to put on or install co-location equipment uh, right away. So that's an advantage. 
Uh, finally, uh, I have two other photos of co-location equipment. Generally, the size of the, of the uh, co-location device that my company uh, provides is about a three-foot by four-foot uh, enclosure uh, mounted next to the um, uh, LTE base station, 4G base station. Or it could be broadband. It doesn't have to be uh, commercial wireless. It could be other kinds of wireless base stations. Anything that needs to be isolated uh, off the AM tower. On the left-hand side is a structure elevated with the uh, co-location equipment on the left there. Uh, I hope that has enlightened you a bit, and um, that's all I have. Hi, uh, thanks, Dan, and uh, thanks, Don. Uh, Chris, I appreciate the, the intro. Uh, my name is John Trent. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Putbury, Sunsacker, and Trent. I've been working uh, either for radio stations or with radio stations, uh, either as a DJ or as, a, uh, as an attorney for uh, almost 35 years. And I, uh, when... When I got a call about this uh, a couple of months ago, I spoke to uh, Don, who I've known for quite a long time. Uh, what did I think about the use of possible co-locations with AM stations for broadband? And I said, well, the first thing out of my, my, my mouth was, well, Don, they're hot towers. Tell me about it. And uh, he enlightened me on some of the, the new technologies that, that Chris has just gone over. And uh, it, it's th this is something that, uh, to me, is a is a. I meant Dan had said a, a win win. It is a complete win for everybody involved, assuming that the AM towers can actually be used. And let me kind of just go through a couple of points. I mean, the first the first thing, the goal of this commission, uh, and we we've heard it from the chairman's office, broadband. Rural area, okay? I represent a boatload of mom and pop AMs. We used to call them old class 4 AM stations or class C stations now. Every little town in the United States, well, not everyone, but mo most towns has a small one kilowatt daytime or, uh, or class 4 style station. They're, they're there. The towers are there. I have in my, my, my own town, I live out in the Shenandoah Valley. There's a little station right in Woodstock, Virginia. Nothing is on the tower. It is a 300-foot tower. Tower's in fine shape. I, I happen to know the owner, and he's painted it recently, and it's structurally sound. These are the type of things that should be looked at. It, it works with the implementation of what the commission wants to do, Here's towers that can be used. We have the technology that's available to use these towers. Now, what does it do? It not, not only for you commercial providers out there, it's a big cost savings for you. Chris had mentioned, and I think you've had other folks uh, kick around $250,000 to $300,000 to build a new site for, uh, uh, for a broadband site. Assuming that uh, uh, the towers are functional, uh, AM towers are functional, y you can use that at, you know, quarter the cost to co-locate. Uh, the, the, other, the other thing that I see here, especially when I'm working with these smaller AM stations around the country, is it's been a struggle. Um, Chris had mentioned that, uh, uh, you know, it's the, the AM stations have had some difficulties over the, the last few years, and it's true. I, I'm an owner of an AM station. I can tell you it's absolutely true. It, it has been difficult, but these AM stations in these rural markets are generally the only voice that, that folks have out there. They're struggling every day. Having the ability to load up a tower in, in the only community voice that's out there is massive. It could save the community's own radio voice and provide better broadband service and other services, including uh, uh, public safety service for the, the public safety broadband. Uh, it just makes sense. 
the the one other thing that looking at looking at this is if you and i i kind of go back to where uh, i'm from i live in the shenandoah valley they are not going to allow the building of more towers along the shenandoah river just not going to happen there's towers that exist right now no way it would go through shippo you know, we, we've wetlands, nothing, I, the, the whole nine yards. I, I talked to some colleagues here before uh, uh, before this session, and it's it it is such a winner that I'm hoping that you folks out there in the audience and the commission really take a look at this and and try. I, I mean, granted, there are going to be some towers, as Chris has indicated, that. Just may not, from a wind loading standpoint, from an age standpoint, might not be usable. But for heaven's sakes, you you need to take a look at these towers. The environmentalists will like it because you're going to be you're going to be using these co-located towers. Uh, the communities are going to like it because they're getting better broadband service, and it's going to save their local stations. Um, and, and Don, that's all, uh, about all I have. Thank you. We now turn to uh, co-locating wireless infrastructure on critical utility infrastructure. Connie Durchak is the president and CEO of Utilities Telecom Council. Connie will discuss how to co-locate on utility infrastructure while recognizing the core utility requirements. Thank you, Connie, and good to have you with us again. Thank you very much, um, Dan and Don, for inviting me and for holding these important workshops. Um, We really appreciate um, your thinking of us and including us in the discussion. The Utilities Telecom Council is... uh, was formed in 1948 to serve the needs primarily of the radio operators and technicians who manage the networks that help support it, the um, the management and distribution of the utility product, whether that's electricity, water, what have you. That still is our core constituent today, although with the advent of grid modernization, smart grid, infrastructure upgrading, that sort of thing, um, those telecom engineers have had to become much more familiar with IT and operations technology. And so the, the core group of ICT, Information and Communications Technology, is what um, UTC serves from a constituency basis. And the sectors that we serve are the energy, water, oil, gas, pipeline, and other critical infrastructure environment. We have our headquarters here in Washington, D.C., but we have offices around the world in Ottawa, Canada, Brussels, Belgium. Um, We are looking to start an office to serve Latin America in Rio de Janeiro, and we recently held an event in Johannesburg, South Africa, as we have a number of African members um, in our European group as well. So we're a fairly global organization. Um, One of the membership sections of UTC is actually called the Utilisite Council, and they were formed in 2007 to serve the interests of the utility companies that um, have co-location as a a, uh, revenue stream, as a a business um, within the core utility business. And so these are actually uh, transmission or distribution asset owners who welcome and actively pursue co-locators on their infrastructure. And so they help with antenna and base station co-location, backhaul in some instances, as well as services, construction, and whatnot. Just a quick snapshot of the U.S. electric grid. Um, We have about, in this country, about 170,000 miles of transmission uh, lines in the associated equipment and, of course, towers to support those. Six million miles of low-voltage distribution lines. Um, We have about 3,200 electricity uh, providers, so generation, transmission, distribution. And we service 120 million residential customers, about 176 million commercial customers, and then um, three-quarters of a million industrial customers. So that's a little bit of an overview of the environment that we're talking about. So there's a lot of steel in the air (laughs) 
and wood poles in the air. Um, and that makes it a, a certainly an attractive co-location environment. Um, there are really four asset types that the, the um, wireless industry looks to the utility industry for from a co-location standpoint. The first is substation co-location. And what we have here in this photograph are two uh, communications towers that are located in a substation. Of course, the utilities have their own communication needs. They have their own private networks that they operate. And so what, ha what has happened in many instances is you'll have the utility companies put up a communications tower, just a regular communications tower like SBA or Crown Castle or American Tower would have, um, and they will co-locate antennas from commercial wireless carriers or the public safety community or whomever on the, that infrastructure. Um, they do this for a couple of reasons. Number one, there's a, a thought that it's beneficial to have the, the antenna owner on your property as opposed to the garage next door. There's some thought that maybe if there's an interference issue, it's easier to manage from that standpoint. Um, but also from a zoning perspective, Typically, a utility substation kind of property tends to be a preferred environment, and so a lot of times you can have a, a, a less of a zoning process associated with getting those antennas on this infrastructure. The second type of infrastructure is transmission, and those, of course, are the big um, towers that house the transmission lines. And there's a couple of places where you'll typically see an antenna or antenna set located on the transmission towers. The first one on your left is an example of a trans, uh, excuse me, an antenna set located in the communication space, which is below the conductors. Um, so typically what the um, utility will require in that instance is that you use a, a certified or approved contractor to work in around that space. Um, but a lot of times they're they're working, you know, on the on the um, it's a telecommunications contractor who happens to be certified and approved by the utility to work in that environment. The other one on the right, as our Sprint speaker earlier this morning um, alluded to, the, on the top of the transmission tower is a much more difficult environment to work in. Um, that's on the supply space. It's actually above the transmission lines. So usually if you want it to co-locate on top of the transmission tower, it will require an outage. Um, and the power companies, of course, would, would need to schedule that outage. And sometimes they're reluctant to do that if they're operating at peak load or near peak load. So, for example, in this, this particular instance, I think this is a tower perhaps in Nevada, um, they aren't going to want to ha schedule that outage in the summertime when they're operating at near peak load. So it's just more difficult and um, occasionally they will do hot work but they really prefer not to. The utilities, if, if you know anything about their culture, is they are extraordinarily safety oriented and they're very, very um, fixated on reliability. So anything that is going to put workers in harm's way or anything that is going to potentially affect the reliability of the grid is a, a, is a challenge for them to, um, to work with. Um, in the next photo on the left, you'll see there's a transmission structure with three co-locations, three antennas. So it's not unusual for them to um, have multiple co-locations on their transmission structures. The one on the right is a DAS, a distributed antenna system on a distribution structure. It's rather rare to have a macro site located on distribution infrastructure. More likely, more likely you'll find a, a DAS or a small cell uh, located on that infrastructure. And then this next set of photos shows there's a pole top on a distribution pole on a wood pole, and then the blow up is, is what the equipment looks like in the communication space. Um, the concern in this environment is that the antenna has to be reach high enough above um, the infrastructure on the pole top that if it happens to fall, it's not going to uh, jeopardize the reliability of that particular pole. And also from an equipment standpoint on the communication space that you have sufficient room for the um, utility workers to climb around that equipment. And then the last type of infrastructure that you'll see in a utility environment is fairly often a water tower. Um, the issues around that are quite similar to those that Monica laid out with rooftops. 
Um, and then in addition, you'll see there's a catwalk, there's a ring around sort of the lower third of that water tower um, at the top. The catwalk has to be far enough, the antennas have to be far enough removed from that catwalk that workers can access the catwalk without, you know, um, going over the MPE for RF. So that's the other concern. And that's essentially the types of um, utility infrastructure that is available in the marketplace to co-locate wireless antennas on. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, last but not least, our next speaker is Robert Reville. Robert is Vice President for Railroad Development at Global Towers. Robert will discuss tower co-locations on railroad right-of-ways. Robert. Thank you, uh, everyone at the FCC. Don, Dan, I appreciate it. Uh, great to be here uh, in discussing this. I, uh, as uh, was mentioned, uh, work for Global Tower Partners. We are a uh, large uh, tower uh, aggregator company. Uh, we have about 15,000 sites that we uh, own or manage, um, a inclusive of about almost 6,400 towers, uh, both domestically as well as internationally. And as a company, we have historically invested in uh, opportunities and strategic partnerships that make sense from a siting perspective. And I run the uh, railroad development group internal to the company, uh, which is specifically focused in leveraging uh, railroad rights of way and existing railroad infrastructure for wireless co-location and siting. Um, Specifically, we, ha we manage and market uh, large Class I rights-of-way, uh, as well as uh, regional railroads and other short-line aggregators, uh, and collectively have about 28,000 miles of right-of-way under management where we uh, actively deploy uh, wireless co-location, both on uh, their existing infrastructure as well as uh, new build tower infrastructure uh, strategically combined with a lot of their assets. We are continuing to grow our portfolio of managed and marketed right-of-ways um, across all Class 1s and other regional railroads. Um, and originally, uh, we became involved in this uh, specifically through uh, an affiliated company of Norfolk Southern Railroad, in which I was a part of uh, managing and marketing um, all of their microwave and uh, VHF and UHF tower facilities um, across their system. Um, it has been an opportunity for us to really take a latent asset and what we feel is the actual operating right-of-way uh, where the railroad had had uh, many uh, assets that have been sitting there over the years that had not been accessible for co-location, um, as well as assets that were unsuitable for co-location. And we've successfully been able to bring about sort of a convergence of the wireless world and the railroad wireless world to ultimately combine these and grow assets uh, and infrastructure uh, both for uh, the commercial wireless users as well as um, our railroad partners and their communications and signaling deployments both now and uh, forward looking into the future. Um, as some of you may or may not know, the railroads uh, maintain uh, various communications and signaling and telecommunications infrastructure. Uh, we are involved in um, the deployment of those uh, both through uh, new towers as well as upgrading of existing and drop and swap related activities on a lot of their UHF, VHF uh, facilities as well as some of their larger microwave structures. Um, these efforts ongoing at, these, at, at, at most of our rail partners um, are in full swing with respect to basically their network modernization plans. Uh, and there's an interesting synergy, obviously, ongoing right now with respect to those efforts as well as the efforts uh, in the commercial wireless space for LTE and network modernization and optimization plans. We feel as a company that we sort of sit in the middle of a lot of this with respect to this asset class 
and are able to cite where relevant and where appropriately uh, sites and co-locatable structures that uh, ultimately serve both purposes. Uh, the railroads are actively building out a positive train control network uh, pretty much across all major class one regional railroads as well as uh, many short line um, companies uh, really over the next five years that are going to require substantial investment on both the parts of the railroad as well as um, other uh, infrastructure providers in that space to build out these base stations. and. We as a company, uh, as Global Tower Partners, has, has managed to uh, step in the middle of some of these deployments and when and where relevant obviously uh, makes some sense both on, on, on for both perspectives. Um, without a doubt, the right-of-way that we manage has uh, always been a underutilized uh, asset class that we've successfully been able to unlock um, over the years and uh, continue to do so with a focus both on uh, railroad communications and signaling growth as well as obviously uh, in, co in combination with many of our wireless carrier customer partners. Um, we feel that this asset class presents itself very appropriately for many opportunities uh, in the marketplace, uh, as, as, as I've discussed and as many of uh, my colleagues here on this panel have discussed as well, it's uh, with a strategic focus uh, both at our carrier customers uh, uh, as well as at our railroad partners um, allow for us to really take advantage of uh, the fact that we are a, in situations uh, that, where we manage and market these assets are a single landlord with an approved process, policies, and procedures in place for siting, for co-location, for tower modifications, um, and for basic drop and swaps of this infrastructure. Uh, these have historically been activities that the railroad has closely uh, monitored uh, and really kept in house. And uh, historically, many of these opportunities have not been available to wireless carriers and uh, through our management of this and of this process uh, it, it, we've really unlocked a lot of the value uh, that's been inherent in a lot of this uh, in a lot of this space um, the other comment that was made earlier and that I will echo is uh, as it relates to strategic infrastructure partners who are non-traditional uh, they're the railroad uh, sits very appropriately sort of in this mix and um, most of the time and m uh, much of the time uh, when and where we're able to work with local municipalities, jurisdictions in general, um, as well as with our friends at the FCC to appropriately push and cite uh, new co-location opportunities to the right-of-way and to our railroad infrastructure assets. Um, there is a process in place that will allow for this uh, much more seamlessly than in the past. And for the most part, jurisdictionally speaking, and 106 related, uh, SHPO NEPA related, uh, it does present itself uniquely in the sense that uh, when and where we can collectively push our efforts, um, uh, it, it, there are many synergies that are created that allow for uh, uh, much faster co-location and co-location that really is viewed as uh, beneficial at the jurisdictional level as well. Um, so, uh, yes, thank you uh, to the FCC. I uh, appreciate the time, and uh, thanks again. Thank you, Robert. <clears throat> and now Don Johnson will direct your questions to the panelists. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> for uh, Phil first, uh, we have a question. Uh, does the uh, revenue from uh, commercial carriers uh, for, for the uh, Hanover County co-locations, uh, does, does, if, if you can answer this, does, does it go into the general fund for the county or is it dedicated to public safety communications? <laughs> it goes into the general fund, but it is earmark for tower maintenance. All right. All right. Uh, and 
Another question that's come up in the public safety realm and, and it are always the concerns about security and control. And, uh, and which we here at the, which we have heard here at the commission. And could you just expand upon that, uh, how, the, how uh, Hanover dealt with that issue and how it's been, you know. Yeah. I think from a public safety standpoint uh, for years, uh, uh, security of its sites has been a major uh, concern. Uh, when we entered into this venture, uh, we said up front that uh, the shelter was the most critical part of the site for public safety, and we would not share that. Uh, we also uh, restricted, not to the point that they couldn't get in and do maintenance, but restricted uh, the access of the commercial providers to times that uh, were convenient to them but they had to notify us that they were there. Uh, we didn't want anybody on the sites that uh, that we didn't know were there, and and they were the two biggest obstacles that uh, uh, we had to overcome. And uh, so far, it's worked out well. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, okay. And um, um, Monica, on the um, can you? It's more about the uh, the the model with the New York the, with New York and how um, you know how that originally came about and uh, and uh, whether you see that as a potential model for other states in the country. Sure, um, I actually wasn't working at Crown when it originally came about, but what I've heard is that it was really. Um, the state of New York had had actually the wisdom and foresight to think about using um, an outside party to to manage uh, the co-location on their structures, and um, and as you can tell from the presentation, it's been greatly successful. I think it certainly is is a model for other states. Um, we've been working with um, a couple of other uh, municipalities, uh, counties, and at least one state to develop a similar program. Um, when you think about it, there are just countless numbers of structures that could be available, um, and it is location, location, location when it comes to co-locating. So um, it makes sense to to have these available to the the um, service providers so that there's um, options for them either on the rooftops or in the right of way, or on any of the towers or other structures. So. I think it translates well to other states, and I think um, it makes a lot of sense from a monetary perspective. Are, are there any challenges that we're in dealing with the, the, the um, with, with municipalities and uh, regarding their own uh, the the structures that they own themselves? Um, well, there it's you know it is their structure, and um, we have um, we have again some history in dealing with either leasing or managing other folks' structures. There's always uh, there's a control issue, as Phil said, and uh, in in the case of New York, the state police maintain control over all the sites. Uh, there's always there's an approval process that we work through with the state agency to make sure that they're okay with that co-location before it's done. So there's a lot of communication back and forth. Um, I think that's the key to success is that just keeping the communications open and making sure that we work together. Um, it really does pay off in the long run. So um, a little little work goes a long way. And uh, uh, for. Chris, uh, um, can you give us some uh, examples where, um, where LBA has worked with a particular AM broadcaster? I think we, uh, um, uh, either in the commercial wireless realm or in, a, uh, in particular, a um, you know a, a setup for a broadband communications with p potentially fiber use. Yes, uh, as I said, um, there's about 10,000 AM towers in 
about 1% of them or less are used right now for AM uh, co-location. Um, several carriers, all of the carriers actually are using our co-location equipment. Um, recently, Verizon um, co-located on an AM tower in Hawaii uh, for an LTE base station, um, uh, a three-sector array, uh, and um, uh, that was because uh, you know the uh, AM station had to had to uh, reconfigure their uh, tower, and uh, Verizon uh, agreed to work with them on that. So that that was one example. Um, another example is a Clearwire installation. Um, where we installed some co-location uh, equipment, uh, a small a small box, if you will, to allow um, uh, coaxial and um, DC power lines and also fiber. Um, and fiber by itself doesn't necessarily disrupt the AM tower, but uh, even the remote radio heads that the carriers are moving toward require... Uh, DC power to make the electronics work. Uh, in addition, there may be coax running up the tower, and therefore, some kind of isolation is necessary to isolate the wireless equipment from the AM tower. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, for uh, John, how do you um, see? Uh, we, we've talked about um, culturally that there, there, there are, you know. Some you know, uh, steps to you know getting it more AM towers used, but uh, with not only with the AM to, uh, community, the mom and pop, but what what could be the commission's role in help in in helping out uh, um, or encouraging the use of uh, AM towers? Well, uh, Don, I think first off, meetings like this, I think help. Uh, I, I know we've had another meeting on this topic before, and uh, I, I, I really think it's something that uh, uh, the commission should push. Uh, uh, the AM community, uh, the broadcasting community, needs to know about this. I, I mean, I, I've read uh, a few articles about this before, you, you know, use of a folded unipole, uh, you know, loading up your tower, hey, there's money out there. But folks just haven't been emphasizing this. This is just such an opportunity. It's an opportunity for the broadcasters. It's an opportunity for the providers. And it's an opportunity for the public to get better, you know, better radio service and, and better uh, um, uh, uh, broadband service. Uh, how the commission can do this, I, I, I you know, it, 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 it may be... I, I, I never say regulating anyone, so I'm not I'm not going to go down that <laughs> road. But uh, I, I, if there's something or, or, or a changing of some of the uh, of, of the forms that are out there, uh, you know, your antenna structure registration, maybe there's a box that you could check on there saying, hey, put us in the, you know, we're an AM station, we we would like to co-locate when when the crown castles of the world go out there and they're looking for, oh, hey. Uh, you know, Fairfax, Virginia, there's a, there's a four-tower directional array in downtown Fairfax, Virginia, WDCT. And, uh, you know, those towers are available for use. They want them on there. Something that can bring people in. I, I mean, I, uh, this is a topic, frankly, that should be brought up at the NAB radio show in Dallas this fall because there's folks that just don't know about it. I can assure you that there are engineers out there. Oh, I'm talking AM guys, old school AM guys. No, we, no, uh, no, no, you're not going to want to do that. You need to look at all of the opportunities that are out there. And I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a great, it's, especially in the rural areas, Don. I mean, if, if people know that you, you can do this, I mean, it's the same with the, the, the railroad towers and some of the, the other utility power poles. I mean, folks just need to know about this, and they don't. Push it. Uh, that's that's how that's how it's going to get done. Is get folks pushing it. One one last thing though, Don, that uh, I, I wanted to uh, uh, also state. A lot of the this is a a uh, in the rural community 
and many of the, not only are they um, uh, mom and pop owned, but many of these stations are minority owned. This is an excellent opportunity there to keep that other. Uh, I've got my mass media hat on. Keep keep that keep that voice with the diversity of voices out there, um, and and keep those folks on the air. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Connie. It's nice to see you again. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> so. Uh, well, uh, it's very interesting from the uh, utility side because there's so much uh, infrastructure and um, also do the utilities uh, use their business radio towers for, for co-location? I know we were talking about the tension lines, and but a lot of the business radio towers are also spread out and in remote areas too. Yes, indeed. The, um, I think what's important to understand is that they have their own internal radio systems that are robust, they're ubiquitous, they have to cover their whole service territory, um, just like a wireless carrier. If they can co-locate on a GTP site, they would prefer to do that than pop up their own tower. So there's, there's a lot of leveraging back and forth in terms of sharing um, infrastructure assets. So, yes, they absolutely do have their own um, business radio towers. Many of them have made those available for co-location. Um, again, like I said, a lot of them will be at a substation environment, which is terrific from a zoning standpoint because it, it's typically an industrial preferred site. Um, so they, it's, it's, a, it's a business model that they understand, that they embrace, and will have co-locators um, come and participate on those sites. And finally, um, Rob, <coughs> the um, with uh, um, w with Global, can you explain a little bit about the the previous City Switch and what its con what the original concept was from Norfolk Southern with uh, with tower co-location, and then the going forward in the uh, uh, in the positive tra train control, if you could explain a little bit of that for the audience since that's sort of a buzzword right now and how that plays out, especially in rural areas. Certainly. Um, as Don mentions, um, we originally, uh, the group that I manage internal to Global Tower Partners began as a affiliated company of Norfolk Southern Railroad. Uh, the railroad built out a uh, about an 1800 mile uh, fiber optic conduit uh, duct network um, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, really up from sort of Jacksonville, Memphis, um, uh, sort of through Atlanta, that stretch, and then really uh, emanating out of Alexandria, going up to Harrisburg, Cleveland, uh, terminating in Chicago, and uh, they obviously picked the wrong time to do it. So <laughs> they uh, uh, were looking at ways in which they could monetize uh, an asset, one, and two, in which they could really leverage uh, what they had deployed with respect to both dark fiber and some lit stretches, uh, and ultimately convert a lot of their own internal communications and signaling <coughs> networks uh, onto uh, a more secure backbone. And uh, we're looking for a solution in this, in this uh, area. So we came in uh, as a separate company affiliated with NS. They were a large shareholder of ours, uh, really with the design of bringing, or really, as we've all discussed here today on this panel, unlocking an asset that had historically been incredibly underutilized um, and uh, undermanaged uh, as it related to everyone outside the railroad world. And uh, as my colleagues here have mentioned uh, in their respective fields, obviously there was a, a huge learning curve with respect to educating uh, the commercial wireless world uh, 
on the practices and policies and procedures of the railroad world. Um, but as we grew as a company and uh, developed uh, hundreds of sites and co-locations on existing infrastructure, uh, the process began to sort of cement itself uh, both on the customer side in the wireless world as well as internally with our own railroad partners. Uh, we transitioned this into Global Towers uh, back uh, in late 2010, really with the aim of growing it to uh, include other class ones uh, in regional railroads as well as uh, various other short line holding companies and aggregators. Uh, and the reasoning behind a lot of this obviously is for the most part uh, we historically had not put the focus, the energy, and the effort uh, into this space uh, primarily because the education process that I previously mentioned was very arduous. Uh, and it, 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 it took uh, the right uh, focus and the right timing. And quite frankly, uh, at this point uh, in the railroad world as well as in the wireless world, there really is a convergence as far as new infrastructure deployment uh, related to technologies, primarily both rail and wireless related. And as we look at these LTE deployments uh, sort of in parallel and in conjunction with things like positive train control, as Don had mentioned, uh, there is a very good opportunity for us as infrastructure providers uh, as well in, in, in coordination and conjunction with the FCC to look at these as opportunities to cite things more appropriately versus the old days of the railroad building it and then uh, all other third parties coming in and trying to figure out a way to sort of coexist. So where we find ourselves right now engaged very actively is in the upfront siting and uh, development of sort of the, the four to five year plan for uh, both uh, railroad communications as well as uh, our third party carrier customers. Um, this for uh, uh, Connie. The question is, uh, um, do you, I guess, meaning the utility industry, have uh, escorted access requirements for carriers, or do you, or do you have limitations of access? Uh, I think probably what you'll find in the utility environment is that. Um, each utility will sort of treat treat it differently depending on their um, level of comfort with having uh, attachers on their facilities. So, for example, if you have a communications tower that's that's in the uh, compound for the substation, what they will frequently do is carve out a little area within the substation so that the rest of the substation is is fenced off, and then they'll have the authorized um, workers come in just to that portion of the substation. Um, if it's in the, in the distribution environment, um, obviously it's those certified contractors that have been approved who are allowed to access that infrastructure. The same with the transmission um, environment. So there's a lot of communication that has to happen. There has to be this, this foundation of trust with the relationship. And um, it's not like, uh, unlike any other sort of third-party kind of site, you, you want to know who's accessing your site, when and how, and under what conditions, and you'll have that spelled out in, in whatever the instrument is, the agreement is that, that um, authorizes that access. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> the last question, I think this is, um, it goes back to, to the, and the, the aim and the rural sites, but but uh, the, the, but um, we haven't discussed we, we've uh, the uh, low power um, wireless internet service providers who do uh, you know uh, uh, fixed wireless systems on uh, unlicensed spectrum, uh, w which has become popular in some of the rural areas, and. Uh, uh, the, the question I discussed about ham radio towers, but I think that the, it, it's the uh, um, also goes to the, both the AM is that um, if, a, if a wireless internet service provider approached an AM uh, AM station, I don't think would there be any problem with co-locating. No, um, it wouldn't. 
we, there's compatibility uh, also with with that type of system on an AM tower. We, it, it could it could be implemented, yes, from a technical standpoint. Uh, um, okay. All right. So once again, I would like to thank all of our panelists for their highly informative presentations. <laughs> And if we could get the panelists for the last panel to come forward, please. So we'll get started with the last panel. Again, if you're listening remotely, please uh, send any questions you have to livequestions at FCC.gov. If you're sitting here, just raise your hand. Somebody will get you a note card and a pen if you want to submit a question. We will have one uh, person uh, participating via uh, conference call. So we're trying to make sure he's up here. I think he's fourth in line. So he'll be speaking after Tim Brown in the lineup, according to the agenda. So we're trying to make sure he's on now. So, um, so we'll get started with that. Uh, the two moderators for this panel, which um, I think both of them have spoken previously, so I don't have to go into uh, great detail, uh, Jeff Steinberg um, from here at the FCC and Tony Perez from NATOA will be the moderators. Um, thank you, Cecilia. Um, so we're down to our last panel of the day, and I, I think in some ways this is really the, the key to a lot of things because we've been talking up until now about the technical considerations and some of the opportunities for co-locations. We've learned that both from a sta business standpoint and in terms of community impact, co-locations can often be the most efficient way to bring broadband and other needed services to the public. And indeed, they may be critical to deployment. Um, but this leaves a, a, a question. How, how can we develop the most efficient processes for co-locations while at the same time ensuring that other community interests are protected? I mean, those of you who are local officials, um, either in the audience or on the phone, know. Um, you've got many obligations to your constituents besides bringing them broadband and wireless services. And while there are many, many benefits to coverage, it's also your job to protect all of your constituents' interests, and I think it's very reasonable to be asking all these questions. 
the good news, I think, is that there are models of success that you can look to in creating your own processes to not only serve the community, but also comply with the law. Um, and you'll be hearing a lot about that on this panel. First, we're going to hear about a Georgia law that has created a uniform process for permitting collocations. Second, we'll hear from representatives of two tower companies and, I hope, a local government, talking about their processes for working together and examples that have made all parties to the process happy. After that, um, we're going to talk about the FCC's nationwide co-location agreement, where we've gr grappled with similar issues in the context of the Federal Historic Preservation Review. And finally, we have representatives of a tower company and a small wireless carrier who are talking about their solution that advanced the business interests of both of their companies while bringing co-location opportunities to a very rural area. Um, look forward to hearing from all the panelists learning from their experiences. Tony, do you have anything? No, I, I agree, too. I think that uh, this is a very important session uh, for, for me as a representing an organization that in turn rep represents uh, a lot of local governments uh, throughout uh, the, the U.S. Um, uh, as I mentioned in my earlier comments, that uh, we uh, together need to find a way to thread uh, the, this needle and, uh, and arrive at common sense solutions that uh, benefit uh, uh, all parties uh, in involved. Uh, again, uh, local governments are big users of our wireless uh, broadband technology. Uh, our, our citizens uh, uh, demand uh, the service, uh, but they also uh, place a unique responsibility on us to, to make sure that these deployments are conducted in a manner that uh, respects uh, community values and is, is, is consistent with uh, preserving uh, neighborhood character, aesthetics, and, and other concerns to local officials in our community. So I'm really looking forward to learning about some win-win uh, uh, solutions and some ways that uh, we can continue to work together uh, to, to, to meet our, our, our various objectives. Thank you. Okay, so our first panelist here is Kimberly Adams talking about the Georgia um, legislation. Um, Kimberly is Zoning and Permitting Manager at Compass Technology Services. Compass is a turnkey services provider for the wireless industry. During the last 15 years, she's worked on hundreds of cell sites for major carriers and infrastructure owners throughout the southeast. Um, Kimberly was also a founding member of the Georgia Wireless Association, and she is currently the co-chair of the GWA's regulatory committee. And the GWA is a nonprofit industry group which supports the wireless industry in Georgia and reaches out to local jurisdictions. Thank you, Jeff and Tony. Um, and thank you all for taking uh, the time, a, a day out of your busy week, I'm sure, to uh, to sit here and, and hopefully learn something about a very important topic or what we think is, which is co-location. Um, I do appreciate this opportunity to speak to you about a law that we do have in Georgia called the Advanced Broadband Co-location Act. Um, it is just now coming up on its two-year anniversary at the end of May, being signed into law. Um, this law came out of uh, much hard work and cooperation between key stakeholders, including the wireless industry, uh, the Georgia Municipal Association, and the Association of County Commissioners of Georgia. The purpose of this act is to ensure the timely deployment of wireless networks, as well as encouraging the use of existing structures by streamlining the procedures for local review of applications to co-locate on existing facilities or to modify such facilities while preserving the local authorities, uh, the local authority over wireless facility siting. Um, this law, again, only deals with co-locations and modifications. I think probably most folks here know what the difference is between the two, but just to, to specify it or, or, or clarify it for those who might not, co-location is when you have an existing tower or tall structure. Um, generally, if it's a tower, it's already been built for another carrier. It is when another carrier, a second carrier, or a third carrier, or fourth carrier comes along and then locates its equipment on the tower, antennas, and then probably equipment on the ground as well within the existing compound. Um, so that carrier is then providing new coverage to that area for them. 
Uh, modification is when that carrier is already co-located on that existing tower and due to technological changes, um, you'll hear a lot about LTE and 4G, those sort of upgrades. That's when we will go back and switch out either antennas and equipment on the tower and or on the ground as well. So it's basically an upgrade of that existing site. Um, and I think if you're on the local government level, I think probably last year and certainly this year, you will be seeing a lot of modifications coming your way. That will, I think, be what most of us are working on this year, in fact. So, um, again, this, this law is pr very specific about what streamlining the process, but also what can be reviewed by the local authority and what and does specify a few things that cannot be uh, asked for as a part of the review process. Uh, applications for collocations and modifications may be reviewed only for conformance with applicable site plan and building permit requirements, um, such as obviously structural reports to make sure it is up to to code on wind speeds. Um, we, we talked about wind loading earlier. That is certainly part of any building permit review process. And also with that, you may have certain jurisdictions that want to see mount certifications to make sure that the, the equipment that is holding the antenna is also up to code. Um, what is different or what did it did streamline in our process in Georgia is actually uh, there cannot be a separate zoning process now within the review. It is a concurrent process. Uh, there is still a zoning process as part of the building permit review process, but again, it is concurrent. Um, it is not subject to any additional uh, zoning approval beyond that issued for the underlying support structure or wireless facility. Uh, what that means is usually we do go to the planning department. There is review as part of the building permit application process, and they will look for such things as to make sure there's no zoning existing zoning conditions on that particular tower site that need to be met, or there's no outstanding compliance issues on the tower site or even the subject property that need to be dealt with. So they're still reviewing it and making sure it is up to code, but it's no longer a separate zoning process, um, certainly not a separate non-administrative process, which we did have a, a few jurisdictions with problems with that where, you know, the, the land use decision has already been made on the tower, obviously, um, conditional use or special use permit. Uh, years ago, but then for every co-location after that, we were required to go back through that land use decision process or public hearing process. So that part is no longer allowed. It streamlined that, that there is an administrative concurrent zoning review as part of the building permit review. Um, within the scope of the review, local governing authorities may, uh, may require uh, a letter certifying that the wireless facility will not interfere with emergency communications, uh, but they may not evaluate the technical business service characteristics of co-location or modification. I think some folks touched upon that in earlier sessions where, um, you know, you, you don't require McDonald's to prove that they are going to, you know, why they need to sell cheeseburgers or, or, or the like. So no longer can, especially for a co-location or modification, you do not have to prove need or the, the business decision of why you're switching out a certain antenna with another antenna, basically, something as simple as that. So, um, and again, as I said, the law has been in effect for two years now. I think it's been working very well uh, that I am aware of. There has been no litigation that has been necessary as a result of this law, whether it be enforcement or on the local government side, um, uh, trying to challenge it. Uh, the first county we had, in fact, that, that adopted it, Gwinnett County, I think within a week of the, the law's passage, changed its entire process. 
Um, they did used to have a separate administrative process. Uh, they streamlined it. Planning Department now does review the application, but as part of the building permit process, which saves about 30 to 60 days off the process. So, um, which is considerable when we're all trying to talk about, you know, deploying hundreds of sites where we're just switching out antennas. It, it really does make a difference. Um, other jurisdictions, we have had to do a little more education outreach to try to get them up to speed on the law, but I think we're there. We finally have our last, that I, I know, hold out, or not really hold out, but just was still requiring a separate process um, that now has changed. and. I think we're all moving forward, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> next up, we have uh, Tim Piccarilli, and Tim is Area Co-Location Director at American Tower Corporation, responsible for the oversight of co-location activity at the, uh, over 8,500 sites across the southern region of the U.S., he and his team provide sales and leasing support, coordinate customer service delivery, site evaluation, and contingency resolution, as well as conduct general project management in support of the uh, wireless industry's infrastructure needs. Uh, Tim is going to focus his, his talk on uh, what his company is doing to be a good corporate citizen and help uh, local uh, uh, planning and elected uh, officials kind of uh, balance the uh, competing needs for uh, broadband, uh, wireless broadband coverage, and while at the same time uh, uh, being sensitive to community uh, values. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, first off, thank you very much to the FCC for putting this event together and having the opportunity to uh, really ha uh, participate in this dialogue, not only with those here in attendance, but those joining on the web. Uh, it, it's really important for us to be able to explain and talk about how we as a company, uh, though we are uh, the, the global leader with wireless uh, infrastructure solutions with over 45,000 co-locatable sites in nine countries, that we still have this strong domestic focus to where we look to make sure that we are good partners, not only with our customers who are providing uh, uh, speed to market in both wireless and broadcast uh, opportunities, but also making sure that that coverage is available and that access is available to those communities that we serve. And, and what I'd like to really promote here is, is that, you know, despise, despise, <laughs> despite <laughs> our, uh, our, our, our scope and reach, uh, we really haven't forgotten a lot of our core values, and some of that goes back to uh, those lessons that we learned back in kindergarten. Uh, one of the first ones is sharing is caring. Uh, you know, American Tower co-location is our core, that we really look for our opportunity to really have a repeatable process that's, you know, process-focused, repeatable in a, in a very grand scale, and it's collaborative in its practice on a day-to-day -day, uh, uh, approach. And our approach is really that. It's our customers and communities. It's in a proactive way. We really look to make sure that throughout the life cycle of a project that we have the different uh, repeatable processes in place in order to make sure that a co-location satisfies all the needs, not only for a coverage standpoint, but safety and all of the requirements in between. So no matter what the co-location project is, we have uh, three major phases that, uh, that play into it. And really, despite whatever the type of asset is, those three major phases are part of our process day in and day out. And those are evaluation, contracting, and construction. And last year alone, here at American Tower, we processed over 14,000 co-location applications. So that repeatable scope, that reliable scale is something that not only is a business requirement for us, but is something that we offer to the communities. It's that, that reliability, that's the consistency and performance for co-location after co-location after co-location after co-location after co-location after co-location. Co you get the idea. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we really like to try to do, though, is customize it. And no matter what the co-location is, we have a number of teams that are internal to American Tower that make sure that those contingencies are not only identified, but they are satisfied and that they match that individual scope. And that's not only on the contractual side of leading our obligations with those municipalities, with those landlords that we might have the, the, uh, the land with or within our specific deeds and zoning uh, aspects, but also those contracts that we have with our tenants that are residing on our towers, our DAS systems, our backup power solutions, or any of the other solutions that we might provide to a, uh, a customer that's looking for a wireless infrastructure solution. 
We have a compliance team. You'll get to hear with our leader of our compliance group, uh, Jenna Metznick, who will walk through our, our, our contingency evaluation that relies upon that and how we make sure that we're good neighbors and good citizens, not only with uh, the federal, local, but the state levels as well. Uh, we have an in-house engineering team that makes sure that the structures are, uh, you know, absolutely sound, not only from a, uh, a structural perspective, but also from an RF perspective, and run a number of services internally. You heard about that earlier in the day today. We also look to make sure that we have a strong field presence, that we're keep making sure our sites are kept up to date, that we have people that are part of the community that are making sure that the sites are safe, that they're properly maintained, and that they uh, meet the satisfactory codes of what the municipalities look for as us of being part of that community. And then if a tower does need to be improved, if we are looking to make structural upgrades, or if the nature of where we are located at changes, that we make sure that we continue upon that as a good neighbor and as a good citizen to match not not only the needs of our customers, but the needs of which the communities that we serve. And a big part of that is that last phase. It's making sure that when we get to the point of construction, that we approve whoever the customer is that we're working with to make sure that they maintain our status as a good citizen as part of that community. And we look at the contractor that they're using. We make sure that they're properly permitted. We evaluate their construction drawings to make sure that the contract that we worked out with them matches to what the plan of construction actually is going to be. And then we also do a pre-construction walk, making sure that everyone is safe, that the conditions within the tower site are properly maintained, and that we have uh, strict control of what's going on so that we can uh, enjoy not only the opportunity to continue to exist inside that community, but the community can benefit from whatever the, the type of wireless coverage or broadcast coverage that they might wish to uh, enjoy. So in short, as American Tower, we look to make sure that we are not only somebody who's providing a solution to the customers that we serve on a day-to-day -day basis, but that we're also a good citizen in the communities by which we serve. And you'll hear from several other people here on the panel today that we really are uh, collaborative in our approach, no matter who the uh, individual uh, you know, major tower operator is or who those co-location facilities are to make sure that uh, we can ma have uh, ubiquitous coverage while still maintaining the, uh, uh, the, uh, the personality of the communities which we serve. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Next, we're going to hear from uh, Tim Brown, who's actually going to provide a unique perspective uh, as both someone who works in the uh, wireless broadband industry, but he's also an elected official. Tim has 12 years' experience in the wireless telecommunications industry in business development management and operations role and is currently in the business development manager for Tower Company in Southern California, Las Vegas, and Hawaii. He's also a member of pro, Mayor Pro Tem for the City of San Clemente, California, and a member of the uh, City Council. So, uh, Tim? Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, and it's a privilege uh, to be with uh, many of these esteemed colleagues up here. Um, as uh, Anthony spoke, I am um, I've been able to approach this in a, in a different light. I've been 12 years in the uh, wireless industry in various capacities. And a few years ago, I was elected onto the City Council of San Clemente, California. And um, until then, I had always approached wireless siting and land use from a very wireless perspective. And, uh, and since then, it has really broadened my perspective to serve on the other side of the, of the I guess, on the other side of the, the, the defense to uh, determine and, and to learn additional lessons about wireless siting that I, I hope to impart today. Uh, first, a little bit about San Clemente, because I would be remiss if I didn't tell you how wonderful my hometown was. Um, San Clemente is, has about 70,000 people. It's midpoint between San Diego and Los Angeles. Uh, it's a coastal California city, and it was founded in 1924 uh, and originally designed as a Spanish village by the sea. It was the first community west of the Mississippi that had an architectural review panel for every structure in the city. Uh, it was designed with red tile sidewalks, really a lovely Spanish colonial architecture. And so we're a community that takes very seriously the idea of village character. And uh, that continues even until now. The, there, there continues to be a battle and development in, in our town uh, over appropriate structures, heights, a whole myriad of challenges that we're faced with. 
And first of all, let me tell you, it's got the best surfing waves in Southern California. I invite you all to come, and I've got some long boards. We could head out, and I could show you how not to surf. Um, <laughs> but I, I wanted to share this uh, only because uh, it is in this perspective that I've learned um, a few considerations in approach to wireless that I hope to impart to uh, uh, folks that may be uh, listening or participating in this, uh, in this forum. And that is, uh, I learned, first of all, the incredible and important preeminent need for public safety as an elected official. Um, this became very apparent to me in September of last year when most of San Diego was plunged into a blackout due to a technical error and somewhere in Arizona, of course, and uh, where they, uh, they caused a blackout in South Orange County and San Diego counties. And um, what ended up happening was we had, uh, I think it was around 14 hours total that we were out of, of power in San Clemente. Now, everything was okay. I was getting texts from my wife uh, for about two, three hours, go get a generator, bring us some food, you know, some of the standard things. And then the texts stopped coming. And then I stopped getting texts from a lot of San folks in San Clemente who love to text me when things go wrong. And then I started to get a little concerned. And what had happened was the battery backups had lapsed on many of the cell sites in the city, and it had plunged my wife and all of her friends into complete and utter panic. They started driving around, you're not answering my texts, what's going on? And I found out that this actually happened quite a bit in San Clemente, that during this blackout, during this time, the lack of wireless coverage was deeply unsettling to many residents in our community. So much so that after the power came back on the next council meeting, we actually took a progressive approach and invited carriers to come and harden the cell sites in the community with generators. It was a big enough concern to us that we offered a permitting holiday to carriers capped at $500 just to let them know we would really like it if you made this capital investment in our community. And uh, it ended up being successful since we've had a number of generators installed and we've got a number in the process. But this is one example of an overriding public safety consideration that ended up trumping much of the concerns about uh, generator noise and, and other items that tend to crop up when it's not placed in such stark contrast. Another important thing about public safety is we also find ourselves extremely uh, proximate to San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station. And so emergency preparedness is a huge component of our city's preparations. And the idea of not having a hardened network is, uh, is for a city leader as being deeply unsettling. And so I saw it as also a critical lifeline to our residents, not only in times of personal emergency, but also in larger public events. And then lastly, in terms of public safety, one of the nice things about being a, uh, in the wireless industry is I know how much due diligence, care, and, um, and planning go into each of these modifications and co-locations. And so I'm 100% confident that any co-location that gets installed in San Clemente is going to be done correctly to code and that there is also no overriding public safety considerations there. The second lesson that I've learned is also about critical infrastructure. We learned last year that there was 123% growth in wireless data usage in um, networks in 2011, and that in the next 10 years, that's projected to grow by almost 80, 90 times current levels of usage. Now, when I look at our city planning and we look at our roads, our sewer, our water consumption, basic public services, and we project out based on usage, capacity, critical infrastructure, if you were to tell me that there would be a 90% increase over the next 10 years of usage on our roads, it might cause my city manager hair to set on fire. I mean, this is, this is a big deal. But yet, we continue to ignore the critical infrastructure needs of our wireless capacities and the networks and the, and the need for future upgrades and capacity on those. And so I've learned that particularly when it comes to wireless networks that we need to look as a city leader as this is a critical infrastructure need. And we need to place it in the hierarchy of priority right in the middle of that uh, in the middle of that mix. And then lastly, an important component of this, one especially important to San Clemente and as a resident, uh, is the planning and aesthetics concerns. Um, you know, I'm very aware of the trade-offs that come uh, in wireless siting. Um, for example, if a municipality decides to clamp down on, on, on height as uh, putting height restrictions into place, one of the trade-offs from that is that they're going to basically force to have two to three to four times as many towers built in the municipality that they would have had before because the carriers still have to meet coverage and capacity requirements. They still have to provide these services. So you're going to be dealing with this issue for years to come because you aren't allowing for co-location. So what I learned to prioritize is the efficient and effective use of existing 
resources within a municipality. That's all it is. It's about the, it's, you know, they use the word sustainability quite a bit in local government. It's about preserving you know, future, future assets for use by, by, by future generations. And this is just a sustainable practice, making sure that your existing wireless structures are being used to their full and efficient capacity, and then looking forward from there. I think that's what co-location is very important towards. All in all, you know, it takes vision um, for any leader uh, to understand the overriding public safety infrastructure needs and be able to balance that with the aesthetics and the community desires for an integrated, something that fits well with the community. But I, I believe and I've seen firsthand uh, that if um, a city leader or, um, or even just leaders within the community can see those needs and then engineer solutions that reconcile that tension between the aesthetic and the, and, and the public safety concerns, uh, we can end up with uh, solutions that will not only uh, allow us to meet the, the, the capacity and coverage needs that we're faced with now, but also prepare for the future needs uh, that we're going to have in five and ten years down the road. And so um, it's been a privilege to be able to experience this, and I hope to be able to uh, draw on these lessons learned going forward, not only in professionally, but also in representing the, the city that I love. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. I think I, we all see a few common themes developing here. Uh, next up we have, uh, joining us on the phone, is uh, C.J. Amstrup from the uh, planning, he's planning Services Manager for the City of Anaheim, and we're going to hear about uh, his experience in California. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, about seven years ago, the City of Anaheim uh, undertook a, a, a cellular initiative to ensure that the city um, and its residents and, and, and people doing business here uh, had adequate coverage. And in order to do that, one of the things that we did was proactively develop um, a strategy that would help wireless providers um, easily uh, expand their, uh, their infrastructure within the city. Um, some of the steps that, that are taken are, are things that, uh, such as uh, what we call them, um, st uh, <coughs> excuse me, stealth installations, which are the sorts of installations you'll find in, in uh, church spires, church steeples, uh, flags, uh, to a certain extent, um, uh, pine trees or, or palm trees, that those be approved basically at a staff level with no need for public hearing. And uh, also that we had uh, standards in place that allowed the um, expansion and co-location of existing monopoles that were already located in, in the city. Um, and that sort of dovetails nicely with the, uh, the new FCC regulations. Um, we, were, we didn't have specific standards about how we would allow um, uh, the, uh, um, the expansion of non-conforming uh, monopoles in the city but we did um, use the standards that we use for other non-conforming structures. And basically, as long as you could draw um, a line around the, the outline of a monopole, um, uh, you could expand anything uh, up to a 10% increase in sort of that, that box that you would draw around a monopole, which allowed improved arrays and uh, on larger systems, even the addition of, addi of, of extra arrays. Through all of these uh, systems, uh, through all these changes in our, our practices, um, since the implementation of our cellular initiative, we've had uh, 123 telecommunication applications, and only eight of those have required public hearings. Um, this has meant that uh, um, we now have 95% coverage in the city. We have uh, coverage for uh, our, our major um, industries, which are tourism. We have Disneyland, obviously. We also have the uh, Anaheim Angels, the Anaheim Ducks. Uh, we have uh, the Honda Center, which is a major um, uh, major entertainment uh, arena, and uh, the Grove of Anaheim. Um, so we have a lot of people coming into the city uh, unfamiliar with the city. We wanted to make sure that they had adequate coverage so that they could uh, stay connected with their friends in case they were separated. We wanted to make sure that it was a... a uh, friendly place for people to come and visit and people didn't have to worry about dead spots. So um, we think that we're, we're well on our way of, to, do, to doing this. Um, so we we've, we've now have 130 new cell sites since this was done. 
Um, also, when a cell site is proposed to be located within city right-of-way or on a city facility such as a stadium or the, um, the Anaheim Convention Center, uh, they don't require any sort of planning review. We simply review them um, as the uh, as the landlord. So we look at ways of integrating them into the facilities, um, really just through through our leasing that we're doing to the uh, to the carriers. Um, and as I mentioned before, with all of that, we are now at ninety five percent coverage. Um, the areas that we still have some um, some uh, blind spots in are located up in the uh, Anaheim Hills in a predominantly um, predominantly residential area, and in those areas we don't have a lot of opportunities for stealth uh, installations. Um, although I will note that of all the cities I've worked in, this is the first place I've ever worked where residents actually call and rather than complaining about the installation of a new, uh, a new cell tower or, or something uh, near their home, they call and complain about the, uh, the cellular blind spots um, uh, up in the hills and want to know what the city is going to be doing about it to uh, to install uh, more infrastructure. So um, if you're out there and, and you you represent AT&T or Verizon, come and let me know because we're, uh, we're trying to get some cell coverage up in the hills, and uh, that's what we have in Anaheim. Hello? Yes, we're, we're still here. Okay, that, that, that concludes my what, what I have. Thank you. Um, our next two panelists, and I'm going to introduce them together, are going to talk about the FCC's process for co-locations under the National Historic Preservation Act. Um, this morning I spoke a bit about the National Co-location Agreement and the substantial increase in size provision. Um, these two panelists are going to give some of their thoughts on recollections of how the um, nationwide agreement came about and, um, and how it has worked to um, facilitate environmentally friendly co-locations while protecting historic properties. Um, Nancy Shamu is the Executive Director of the National Conference of State Historic Preservation Officers, which is the professional association of um, gubernatorial appointed officials who carry out the nation's historic preservation program under the NHPA. Um, as executive director since 2000, Nancy is responsible for facilitating communication among the SHPOs, as well as their communication with the um, federal agencies, including the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, with Congress, and with the historic preservation community. Among her many other accomplishments, Nancy represented the SHPOs in negotiating the nationwide co-location agreement and the NPA with the FCC and the Advisory Council. Um, I've worked closely with Nancy for many years, and I do welcome her presence on this panel. Um, Bill Hackett is Senior Manager of Federal Regulatory Compliance for T-Mobile USA. In that role, he is a member of T-Mobile's team that's responsible for compliance with federal regulations, including regulations of the FCC, FAA, and the EPA. Um, Bill has been working in wireless compliance since 1998, first with Western Wireless and then Altel, and then since 2006 with T-Mobile. Sure. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, I must say, all the jargon I've heard this afternoon meant, went totally over my head. So, um, as they used to say, I'm Monty Python. Now for something completely different. Um, I'm Nancy Shamu. I work for all the State Historic Preservation Officers, and um, as Jeff said, the State Historic Preservation Officers carry out the National Historic Preservation Act for the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation and the National Park Service. So those of you who are involved in, um, in the creation of telecommunications networks, I'm sure you've had lots of experience with my members. And I was told when I came in today that somebody actually said something nice about a SHPO today. So I don't know who it is, but um, thank you. Um, what I wanted to do, I was sort of taking an adverbial approach to my um, limited remarks. I want to talk about who, what, how, and when. Um, first of all, who, um, I told you who I was, or I am, um, and also the fact that the State Historic Preservation Officers do more than just deal with wireless communications. Um, this gentleman talked about 14,000 um, co-locations 
that American Tower dealt with, well, that's roughly the number of projects each SHPO office deals with from absolutely every federal agency, from the Federal Highway Administration all the way down through the Department of Energy, who's giving somebody's grandmother money to weatherize her house. So um, the SHPOs are all are all pretty busy, and they all have a pretty big work workload. That's that's sort of the who. Now, what what are the SHPOs looking for from um, from industry when industry comes to see them? Um, I, the um, overwhelming comment I get when when I talk to them, talk to my members, is that the um, the, te the, the telecommunications industry needs to realize the National Historic Preservation Act is a federal law and take it seriously. And the other most important thing, I think, is to make sure that the historic consultants who are working for you know what they're doing um, and are not creating more work when they go see the SHPO. Because if the consultant comes and doesn't know what they're doing, that's just a whole nother uh, workload in terms of doing a 106 training for um, for the consultant, and this is this is more a problem that took place years ago than than one that exists now. I think all of the SHPOs would agree with sort of the theme I've heard this afternoon, and that is common sense. What is the common sense solution? How do we provide the appropriate coverage, and how do we also, as the mayor elect of San Clemente said, um, respect Community, um, community values. And I think all SHPOs would also support 100% um, the whole concept of co-location, of don't build another tower, put the antennas and the, on the equipment on a tower that's there already. Um, now, in terms of um, how, how would you do, um, how would you approach more streamlining and, and bringing common sense more into this venture? Well, first of all, there, there are five things that are in effect now in terms of streamlining. First of all, there's the National Programmatic Agreement, um, which deals with um, Section 106 compliance uh, and the um, telecommunication system very broadly. Um, secondly, there's the co-location agreement, which I think is a way to really move, move things through um, very quickly. And then third, which I just remembered today, is, is the agreement that the FCC put through with the Rural Utilities Service and NTIA in the Department of Commerce. And don't ask me what it means. I never can remember. But um, when the when the uh, American Recovery Act came through in 2009, and there was there was this big infusion, $14 billion, to um, improve broadband, the three agencies led by Stephen Del Sordo, who meets with his counterparts in those two agencies weekly, got together and figured out how we could use the existing FCC agreements and permitting processes to facilitate um, approval of the um, funds that RUS and NTIA were distributing. And then the other two things I think are really um, remarkable contributions that the FCC has made toward historic preservation, and I don't think there there is another federal agency who has really made a similar investment. And they are, number one, the TCNS system, which um, allows Indian tribes to self-identify the area that they are interested in, so consultants in the FCC um, know which with which Indian tribes to consult. And then the second thing the FCC did was to make this big investment in E-106. So it's now possible to do Section 106 filings electronically. And if my members who are sort of stuck in the past um, will, um, I think, kind of open their eyes and maybe buy a new computer, I think more and more of them will be using the, the E-106 um, E106 system. So I think those five things really helped move this historic preservation review process along and and get the um, the wireless service out to people who need it. Um, and then what could industry do to streamline things? And it seems to me, as I said before, it's important if if industry. Um, takes the process seriously and makes sure they have consultants who knows 
who know what they're doing. And I think also, if you're planning a big build out in a state or an area, um, it would be helpful, I think, if you could meet with the SHPO in advance and say, this whole process is coming, uh, we're going to do a thousand new whatevers, um, and see if you could somehow work out a, a process or, or figure out a way to get each of the sites reviewed as expeditiously as possible. Now, what about streamlining goals for the future? Um, it seems to me the, um, the FCC and the telecommunications industry and historic preservation have really forged a, oh, there goes the flag, um, a strong, um, a strong work, working relationship. And I'm hoping that, that we can get together in the future and identify areas of um, where streamlining and common sense can occur. Um, and that we can look at the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation's regulations, particularly the alternatives provided in 800.14, to figure out um, broad programmatic ways to comply with the law, but do it in an expeditious manner. And my secret hope is somehow we can get all this legacy Twilight Towers stuff resolved. You know, the towers are up, nobody's going to tear them down, so let's just go ahead and co-locate kid on them. Um, good. <laughs> and, and, the, and the last thing is, is when. Well, I think we need to do it now and we need to start right away. Ready? Okay. Uh, well, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I guess I would have to say thank you, Nancy, because you actually covered a couple of my points. So oh. I appreciate that. Um, I can go home now. Um, but I would like to begin by thanking the FCC for coordinating this very important and timely co-location workshop. Uh, with the increased demand for broadband and, and advanced wireless services that we've been, as we've been hearing about all day, and with the increased use of smartphones and tablets, the rapid deployment of new wireless facilities is more important now than at any time uh, in the history of the wireless industry. One way for wireless carriers to rapidly deploy new wireless facilities is, of course, through co-location, whether that be on existing telecommunication structures, um, such as towers or DAS systems, or on non-telecom structures, such as buildings, water tanks, billboards, uh, and utility poles. And as Ed said, Ed Roach said this morning, we will actually put our antennas anywhere we can. Um, when looking to deploy a new wireless facility, T-Mobile considers co-location as the first option. Not only is co-location less expensive and uh, than building a raw land facility, it can be done quicker and with uh, less impact on the environment. As a result, a significant number of T-Mobile antennas are co-located on existing structures. The co-location programmatic agreement of 2001 uh, streamlined the co-location process and created a set of rules governing co-location on towers, buildings, and, and other structures. For over a decade, the co-location agreement has provided a useful and uniform framework that allows wireless uh, service providers, including T-Mobile, to rapidly deploy new wireless facilities on existing towers and infrastructure owned by uh, tower companies and by other wireless carriers. Conversely, the same regulatory framework affords other carriers uh, the opportunity to rapidly co-locate new wireless facilities on towers owned by T-Mobile. Further, by encouraging co-location, the FCC is reducing the number of towers that must be built, uh, which also lessens the uh, potential impact on historic properties. T-Mobile is hopeful that co-location will gain added momentum as a result of the recent uh, co-location by right legislation passed by Congress. Also, as mentioned by Nancy a couple minutes ago, uh, the development of the FCC's Tower Construction Notification System, or TCNS, has significantly streamlined the co-location process because it provides up-to-date information on whether tribes want to be notified about co-locations in their areas of interest. To further streamline the co-location process, and again, I thank Nancy for leading into this, um, I respectfully ask that the Commission provide uh, clarification and guidance on two items. Uh, one would be on distributed antenna or DAS systems, and the other would be on so-called twilight towers. Those structures that were constructed after the effective date of the co-location programmatic agreement uh, signed on March 16, 2001, and the effective date of the nationwide programmatic agreement on March 7, 2005. When it comes to the deployment of DAS systems, T-Mobile requires its DAS providers to complete a Section 106 NEPA review of each node in the proposed DAS system. On a system... No, 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 no. <laughs> 
Okay. Um, on a system consisting of 100 nodes or more, this can be quite a time-consuming and cost-intensive endeavor that can significantly delay the deployment of a system. Uh, this seems to be a disproportional effort, given that these nodes will most likely have no significant impact on the environment. Recently, T-Mobile developed a scope of work with American Tower and my counterpart, uh, Jenna Metznik. Um, uh, American Tower is also one of our primary DAS providers. Uh, we worked on this uh, scope of work to streamline the review as much as possible, given the uncertainty of what is really necessary under the rules. The scope of work ensures that, as a wireless licensee, uh, we meet all of our federal compliance obligations and that, as a wireless service provider, we can rapidly provide new and enhanced services to our customers. Clarification of the Section 106 NEPA review process for DAS systems will help expedite build-out as it will decrease the amount of time it takes to complete the regulatory review process and deploy new DAS systems. Second, I respectfully request that the Commission exempt from Section 106 review the thousands of towers uh, that were constructed during the twilight period from 2001 to 2005 when it was unclear whether SHPO sign-off was required. This lack of clarity led to a proliferation of towers that may have been constructed without fully completing the Section 106 review process. As a result, these towers are often not offered for co-location. Exempting these towers from further review will not only dec decrease the Commission's workload by eliminating the need for curative actions, it will greatly increase the industry's ability to rapidly co-locate and deploy wireless facilities on existing structures that have been part of the nation's landscape for at least eight years. T-Mobile continues to support the Commission's uh, present co-location efforts and future initiatives that could significantly increase the number of potential co-location platforms and speed up the build-out of wireless networks. Thank you. Certainly not least, I have the privilege of introducing the next two speakers, and they have a kind of a complimentary uh, uh, presentation, so that they've asked that I introduce them uh, together. First, we have uh, Jenna Metznik, and Jenna is Director of Regulatory Compliance at American Tower Corporation since 1999. She has been a leader in the company's compliance department and instrumental in the establishment of best practices with numerous federal agencies, state agencies, and local governments. Um, in November, she gained oversight of the FAA FCC filing program and to, continues to oversee the env environmental compliance program. We also have Greg uh, Whitaker, and I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, Greg is a founding principal with the telecommunications law firm of Herman and Whitaker. Uh, he has 25 years of legal and public policy experience. He primarily focuses on regulatory and policy issues relating to rural wireless and wireline industries, as well as on transactional matters and spectrum um, auctions. We're going to spend some time talking about the uh, policy uh, and other considerations in the site acquisition uh, process with a focus on the importance of environmental review. So you're up. Thank you, Tony. Hello. Hello. Okay. Um, thank you, Tony, and uh, thank you to the FCC for inviting me to be part of this uh, very informative discussion. Uh, I think my colleague, Tim Picarelli, gave a great profile of American Towers' business. Our core business is co-location. And uh, listening to everyone today, um, it, it's, it's just so interesting uh, to hear just the, the common successes, common challenges uh, uh, between all of the companies, all of the presenters in American Tower. Uh, with our portfolio of over 21,000 sites across the U.S., we really have experienced you know, everything we've heard today, everything described today. Um, you know, in terms of co-location challenges. And the compliance team's vantage point is really interesting. It, it's really exciting because we get to touch every project team within American Tower. So we're working with the new site development team, we're working with the redevelopment team, we're working with the DAS team, and we're working with the acquisitions team. And uh, today, Greg and I are going to talk to you about uh, how we worked through uh, an acquisition portfolio uh, and uh, in particular, how we completed the uh, the compliance review of a uh, um, uh, uh, portfolio in uh, in New Mexico, and uh, American Tower continues to see acquisitions as a really uh, smart way to grow our business. 
Uh, we have a dedicated acquisition team that works with a market research team, a financial planning team, uh, and a very skilled sales team that all together they're able to answer that preliminary question of can we do more with these assets? And once we open the door and, and figure out that the answer to that question is yes, uh, we're looking at a, a solid portfolio that we think we can do more with, uh, then the other, uh, as Tim puts it, uh, contingency evaluation teams. Sounds very, uh, very mm -hmm. official. I haven't used that term before, but I'm going to use it now. Uh, contingency evaluation teams step in, and we take an even closer look uh, site by site uh, on the legal and title, you know, health and fitness of the portfolio, uh, zoning, local approvals, uh, engineering, are, are these assets uh, structurally sound and can they hold more uh, uh, installations? Uh, we look at environmental, uh, not only from a, a, a NEPA compliance perspective, but also from a hazardous materials compliance perspective. And uh, then we, we look at the, uh, the FAFCC filings and uh, make sure that everything's in order there. Uh, so, you know, when we're asking, can we do more with these assets, we're really asking, is this where the carriers want to be, or is this where they need to be? Uh, is this where they're looking to enhance coverage and capacity uh, to promote broadband acceleration, to promote public safety? And in the course of looking uh, for the right portfolios and the right locations, uh, we identified a great opportunity, as I said, in rural New Mexico, uh, a portfolio of over 150 sites owned by a rural carrier, uh, Plateau Communications. There we go. So there uh, is is the general vicinity. Uh, and Greg, if I could give us a little bit of flavor. So uh, I'm Greg Whitaker with uh, Herman and Whitaker, and I do represent Plateau Telecommunications. And Plateau is a wireless carrier in eastern New Mexico and west Texas. Uh, they serve a, an area, just to tell you how rural it is, It's they serve an area approximately 50,000 square miles in eastern New Mexico. That's about uh, seven people per square mile. And their, their service area in, in West Texas is much more dense. That's about, it's doubly as dense, 13 people per square mile. So we really are talking about a, a very rural, you know, area. Uh, but despite that, you know, Plateau has substantially covered its area with mobile wireless and high-speed Internet and built for what, what for Plateau, uh, you know, a small rural carrier, it was a, a, a substantial portfolio of towers. Uh, but as we've heard today, uh, and sort of the maturation process, particularly of rural companies and, and small companies, those towers aren't necessarily their utilization isn't necessarily maximized. And it's an asset class that isn't isn't fully maximized, and thus right, right. So uh, we've heard this term used already. I think Monica uh, in the New York case, uh, win 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 transaction. We feel that's true here. Uh, we know, you know, again through the market research. Uh, and, uh, you know, once we entered formal negotiations through uh, the more layered due diligence review process, we know that we can take these uh, towers with a single tenant and make them multi-tenant sites. And Right. And so we, we think that there were or we, we know that there are significant both public and private uh, benefits, public interest benefits, to this transaction, um, as we're talking about today, the first and foremost it would facilitate co-location. Okay, so uh, you know this would accept, potentially accelerate the deployment of mobile broadband in a rural area. Uh, it would, of course, as we know the benefits, you know, eliminate the need for additional towers and the potential impact on the environment and historic properties. Would also open the uh, towers up to potential competition which is also another public, in, as well as facilitating deployment of public safety, broadband, mobile broadband public safety. Um, Plateau mm -hmm. is a, a wireless provider. By maximizing its resources, Plateau could reinvest those proceeds, and Plateau is in the process of deploying 4G mobile broadband wireless to rural New Mexico. So that's another, you know, both public and private 
uh, benefit, and presumably American Tower uh, is going to maximize revenue on these towers for another, another you know, benefit there as well. Yes, yes. But, but the challenge that we had is, as Nancy and, and, and Bill, we, you know, the tower owner in this case had not completed perhaps fully all the reviews, particularly on Twilight Towers, mm -hmm. which posed then a challenge for completing the transaction to achieve these, these benefits. Yeah, and let's look at that. Um, let's look at uh, uh, the the NEPA compliance, um, you know, program, and exactly what we're looking for uh, when we're evaluating an acquisition portfolio. Uh, first and foremost, I mean, Tim mentioned earlier, uh, you know, we want to be a good neighbor. Compliance, environmental compliance in particular, is is about being a good neighbor. Uh, it's also good business. Uh, our compliance files need to be in order uh, to make good on the promise of speed to market. We've heard that from Bill as well. I, uh, compliance is part of the American Tower Make Ready model. I'm sure the same is true of Crown and SBA. That's in 2012, we need to make sure that we have proper evidence of compliance in order to guarantee a streamlined co-location process. Our customers want... Uh, as part of the, the co-location approval packet, they want a, uh, a, a written compliance statement signed by the wireless facil facility owner, uh, and we're prepared to give them that. And so we need to look at, um, you know, prospective acquisition sites to determine, uh, you know, are we going to be able to make those compliance representations? Are we going to be able to give that uh, compliance verification? Uh, and then, you know, how are we going to uh, follow through with providing the supporting documentation? So our stepwise approach is, is very simple. When we look at an acquisition portfolio, we're confirming uh, the tower facility specifications. It sounds very simple, but it's, uh, it can be a challenge to look through uh, a potential um, uh, acquisition portfolio file by file. Not everything is is digital, so in some cases, you know, we need to go to uh, the the seller's office and you know pull files from a file cabinet and look through uh, piece by piece. Is the environmental documentation there? And we have to make sure that that we're working off of the exact project specs or, or the exact uh, existing tower site specs. Uh, and location details. It's very important. Uh, we need to identify the date of original tower construction uh, given the programmatic agreements that are in place. Uh, we use those as our guideposts for what exactly is the documentation standard for uh, Section 106 uh, compliance based on tower build date. Uh, we review the existing NEPA documentation attached to each and every site. Uh, for not only Section 106 flags, but, you know, the, there can be wetlands flags, there can be protected species flags, and we need to make sure all of that is in order. Uh, we'll request additional NEPA documentation uh, from the seller if needed, uh, or the seller's environmental consultant, or in some cases we may need to go to an installed customer on the tower and ask if, if they've done uh, anything that would be of value uh, for our compliance file. And then if... Uh, we're missing critical documentation uh, that, you know, that that data gap prevents us from issuing the compliance verification to our co-locating customers, uh, then we need to go back to the seller and come up with a plan to begin the conversation with the FCC as to how we cure uh, those data gaps, those, those documentation defects. Yeah, exactly. And just to emphasize during these transactions how critical the the documentation is, and admittedly, you know, working with small companies, it is, it is often a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, small companies don't uh, have, generally have the benefit of a, a Jenna or uh, a Monica or, or Bill uh, unless they outsource it, and that, that may be uh, what we're seeing going to as well. Yes. So, do you, uh, 
there are two more slides, but I, I think they're gone, so. <laughs> okay, this is just, uh, this we wanted to, to put up here. Of course, I'm not going to go through uh, each of these line items, but I wanted to put up um, this listing of uh, the areas of, of critical review under the NEPA regulations. Uh, to, to, and the supporting documentation we're looking for in the FCC NEPA assessment report uh, to show you that this is a lot more than a checklist. I know a lot of people refer to this as a NEPA checklist review. This is a lot more than a checklist. You need to hire the right environmental, prof uh, environmental professionals, uh, and it's really a, a range of disciplines, biologists, wetland scientists, uh, historic, um, historians, uh, archaeologists, uh, to uh, you know, complete a proper rec uh, records research, uh, field investigation, uh, consultation, and reporting. And when I say reporting, there's a lot of work to show. You know, we need a lot of supporting documentation to make sure uh, that, again, we can issue the, uh, the compliance verification to our co-locating customers. So to, to wrap up this particular acquisition deal, uh, you know, it was challenging. Uh, the, the curative process uh, lasted almost a year uh, where uh, we worked with Plateau, our outside counsel, uh, very skilled, worked with Greg uh, to formulate a plan with the FCC to approach New Mexico SHPO and Texas SHPO uh, to determine a, a post-construction review scope uh, for a number of facilities. And uh, the FCC was our compass throughout this process. They were very patient with us uh, and you know, helped set the tone uh, with the SHPOs that this is, this is right for this rural community to promote co-location on these assets and uh, you know, help open the door for a post-construction review, which is a pretty rare, you know, pretty rare for a SHPO to agree to. So we're very thankful for the FCC's uh, help with this. And uh, in terms of you know, uh, uh, the process going forward when we have acquisition deals, uh, I echo what Bill stated earlier that uh, we're, we need a consistent, repeatable pro approach uh, there as well. Uh, we need for Twilight Towers uh, that are maybe not changing hands right now uh, and those that are. We need to have a curative process in place uh, to make these co-locatable, marketable assets. And, and I would just like to, to echo that as well. And, and Nancy, I, I do have something nice to say definitely about the, the, oh, uh, the, the Texas and New Mexico SHPOs and, and the FCC for, for their vision and, and very hard work on this project uh, and to, to, to realize the, the public interest benefits there in New Mexico, particularly. I want to, want to thank them very much. Uh, and, and would particularly echo, particularly in rural areas. I mean, I work with many rural and small companies, and I mean, it's just axiomatic that it's the economics in rural er areas are, are certainly more challenging. And uh, you know, it's one of the ways that we can facilitate that is to increase co-locations, reduce the cost of employment, speed the deployment uh, of rural broadband. And so, certainly, I, I would echo that that we we need to promote and encourage processes that allow the efficient uh, use of co-location and maximization of towers, particularly in rural areas. Thank you. Okay, we do have um, some time here for questions and answers, and we have, um, we've gotten a couple of them in, and we have some questions of our own, but if other people want to submit either in the room on index cards or on the web by um, submitting them through the live questions line, um, we welcome that. Um, I'm going to just start off with one here, which I think is really a question more for, for me than for, for any of the panelists. But um, it says, since Congress has mandated intensive use of public safety towers, how can these towers be cleared when there are historic preservation questions? And I think that the, um, you know, the, the basic answer to that is that that's, you know, that that is an issue that's going to be coming up certainly over time. Um, I think part of 
um, it's some of the same questions that Greg and Janet dealt with in, uh, you know, in what they're talking about, and um, and we worked through that. I think we, we've heard what, what several members of the, the panel have said in terms of looking for a more consistent process for, you know, particularly for what they call the twilight towers between the um, nationwide co- the collocation agreement and the NPA. And I think that that's something we're going to be, um, you know, working with all of you on in terms of broader processes, but certainly in terms of individual cases. Um, we do work with the state historic preservation officers and, um, you know, we, we do see the importance of there are these assets out there, and it's it's silly for these assets to be out there and now not be able to be used. We you know we're, we we don't want to be encouraging noncompliance, but on the same at the same time, um, no point putting up a second huge piece of steel right next to the one that's already there. Um, you want to do that one? brought in from. Uh, from email, and uh, someone referred to some of the comments made by uh, CJ in, in Anaheim about uh, their citizens uh, calling uh, the planning department for the first time, clamoring for wireless services and wondering why they have gaps in coverage in, in, in some areas. And the question relates to, uh, I guess it's to both Tim Figarelli and, and Tim Brown, uh, do you not see uh, some kind of shift in the community where uh, residents are now more more, more receptive to kind of the, the business and infrastructure needs of the wireless industry, and you're getting less of the resistance that, that you've experienced in the past. I'll, I'll take that. You know, as, as an elected official, I used to wonder, uh, first of all, I have to, I have to recognize, um, you know, we're, we're pretty lucky in, in California because we have the California Wireless Association, which is very proactive on these events, and they have done a great job in, in education for not only local elected officials, but the rest of the industry on these. Um, and one of the things that, <laughs> it's an interesting change of perspective. I used to go to these council meetings when I was doing zoning and permitting and wonder, why don't these elected officials get it? You know, why, what, you know why, why, why can't they understand the need for these communication? Now sitting on the other side of, of the wall, I get it. It's a confusing cacophony of voices that you're hearing there and everyone's clamoring and the Greek chorus is singing in the back and you just, you don't, you, you know, it, it can be a very confusing thing. But something clarified this very much for me and it was an observation that um, someone made to me about how in a given council meeting you could have a number of people that show up with concerns about a cellular site. But then you realize about how many people every month vote when they pay their wireless bill within the range of that tower, they vote with their pocketbook for that service. It kind of puts things in perspective for officials that they literally, every time they buy a smartphone for $300 or they write a $150 check for wireless services, they are affirming the need for wireless services in the community. And you cannot ignore the economic realities of that pocketbook. And so I recognize the concerns on a number of residents regarding, say, the sound of a generator or the, you know, the sight lines and the visual concerns. Um, but I also recognize that there is a very large majority of people who frequent our community as tourists or who live there as residents who look at this as not an option anymore. This has become a critical public safety requirement. And it is transitioned. I, I, it's only been in the past few years where it has made that jump from luxury good to must have all the time. And so as an elected official, um, I've noticed that. I, I've noticed that you, you, you get people who are a little bit more vocal. And they don't, they used to turn their ire only exclusively on the carriers. And now they'll periodically, you know, let me know they're unhappy about things. And, and of course, that's what we do as elected officials is take that level of abuse. And that's what we should do. Um, but yes, I, I've noticed a, a trend is, is very different from that, and and uh, and it's only going to get more and more as time goes by. Okay. Um, all right, I'm, I'm going to post this. I'm really for Nancy and Bill. Um, and this morning when I um, I did a presentation talking about um, I think Bill, you were probably here. I don't think Nancy had arrived yet, but I, I talked about the the middle class tax relief act that was passed a few months ago, and the provision in there that um, that provides for um, 
for, for local government approval of co-location applications if they don't involve a um, substantial change in the dimensions of the tower. And I talked about the co-location agreement provision for substantial increase in size um, as something that someone could look to in trying to figure out what is meant by substantial change in dimensions, which the statute doesn't define at all. And, um, and somebody asked me at that point, well, how has the substantial increase in size worked under the co-location agreement? Has, um, has it done what it was intended to do? Have there been disputes around it? And I said, you know, in my experience that, um, that it's really worked very smoothly. I've heard, you know, very little in terms of either unhappiness with it or um, uncertainty about it. But I um, wanted to ask whether that's been your experience as well. actually have to say that as as what we encounter a lot of times when we're offering co-location or, or modifying a tower we are not really increasing the size of the tower um, and the, the cases where we do we either try to keep it under the 10 percent increase um, or if we exceed that level we obviously go through the review and we'll you know submit a sec, uh, form 621 um, I've I think that it's worked very well for us because it is a set defined term it's 10 percent or the addition of the cabinet um, and it's very easy for, for carriers to comply with that. And if if sure. I could uh, add that uh, the programmatic agreements make the Section 106 piece of the FCC's NEPA rules the most instructive of any part of, of the rules. And it's very helpful. The 2001 co uh, co-location PA uh, defines what co-location activity needs to be put into uh, an environmental review. And the 2004 Historic Review PA uh, defines exactly how you need to go about it. You know, records research, field investigation, consultation and reporting methodology. Uh, very helpful. And, and the 2004 Historic Review PA uh, also offers us uh, some excluded, uh, a, a listing of excluded activity. And I would just add uh, that while, yes, the, the 2001 co-location uh, programmatic agreement seriously limits the co-location projects that get into uh, Section 106 review and consultation. Uh, the, the vast majority of modifications, site modifications that do get through are, in our experience, uh, compound expansions, not height extensions. Uh, and interestingly, and I think Monica may have mentioned this uh, in her statements earlier, you know, when you look at the 2004 Historic Review Programmatic Agreement, uh, one of the listed excluded activities is replacement of a tower plus any extension or expansion of the lease area up to 30 feet in all directions. So the presumed minimal impact of expanding the, the tower facility footprint uh, associated with a replacement tower should be the same without a replacement tower. And so I think it's, uh, that's an improvement area uh, for, or, or possibly a clarification, that not every lease expansion that does not have a replacement tower associated with it should go into uh, Section 106 review and consultation, just those that you know, extend beyond 30 feet outside the existing lease area. Uh, more of an uh, open-ended uh, question. Uh, in my town, uh, Seattle, we've been trying for some time to um, uh, incent private investment in a uh, fiber to the home, a, a wireline uh, competitive uh, pr uh, provider. Um, uh, but in that in that kind of, of, of network, uh, well, we can kind of get our arms around it. Um, in, in the sense that we know the, the fiber paths that need to be taken. We know where more or less your remote terminals and nodes uh, need to be placed in the, either the right-of-way or, or public property, uh, where the head end goes, and so and how long it will take to build and, and so forth. So we can kind of plan for that and understand the uh, the um, uh, the municipal assets that can be leveraged to create that kind of network. However, when it comes to, to wireless, there's kind of this great unknown. It's an industry that, that's facing uh, exponential uh, growth uh, with, with no end in sight. Uh, just kind of logic kind of uh, dictates that at some point there will be some type of 
market uh, saturation or that 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 exponential growth will will taper off of somewhat. So I guess. It's a long-winded way of saying if my mayor uh, asks me, okay, is there ever going to be this end for more of these towers and, and antennas, do I just tell him I really don't know or can is, is there some type of, uh, let's say, horizon to this? And that's for anyone on the panel. I think one of the things that uh, that we're seeing uh, throughout the wireless industry is, is that if there is an end in sight, it's something that is much further out than anyone really has visibility to right now. Mm-hmm. Tim had just mentioned about the, the proliferation of personal use and public safety in the wireless sector and, uh, and, and how people have this innate need to be able to be connected at any one point in time. And for myself personally, as just a, a side story, when I came here to D.C. from Boston, I left my cell phone on the charger and don't have it with me. And I fully understand why they call it cell phone or smartphone users, because Mm -hmm. the withdrawals I'm going through are strong (laughs) enough to have my family and friends, if they're watching, the intervention ceremony you're putting together back in Boston is not necessary. I I understand I have a problem. Um, But beyond, beyond the individual users and the public safety, we're also seeing a lot of businesses really embrace the need for this ubiquitous, this overlying, this incredible wireless data transfer in sectors that had never really even considered in the past. And I think that's where you see that that opportunity and growth. I think that's where co-locations become very important, not Mm -hmm. just to the individual users uh, on us on a personal level, but is really core to the needs for businesses to be able to grow and develop in ways that we understand today or ways that might be being developed in a laboratory that are beyond anybody's imagination here inside the room or, or watching on the web. Yeah, I would I would agree with Tim. If if there's that end in sight, we can't see it yet because mm-hmm. it's still on the other side of the that hockey stick curve. So I don't think we can see over the the crest mm-hmm. yet on that. Yeah, I, I don't think I don't think there's anyone in the industry that you know. When I started in the industry a decade ago, I thought we'd be done five years ago. Uh, frankly, I thought you know I, I should find something else to do because the wireless next will be built and we'll be out of a job and there it's over. I, that was a lot mm-hmm. of fun. But it continues to exceed our expectations only because we live in an incredibly energetic and creative nation in a world that is constantly pushing the boundaries of what we think is possible and what we think we want. I tell you right now that it's my, my own daughters are going to be the ones that are going to be taxing the network for the next 40 years. I mean, I, I've got four daughters, and they love Netflix. And they love, I'm sorry, AT&T. I, I apologize right now, but they love to tax your network. Right. And we will see a, ne- a generation as, as medical applications, and there's the emergence of all of these other um, uses that come out of nowhere that continue to make our lives. I mean, could you imagine what life would be like? Before the smartphone, do you even remember? I know he can. He's in withdrawal. <laughs> but again, we're 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 dealing with uh, you know we're dealing with such an incredible expansion mm-hmm. of convenience and and just an amazing technology that I, I don't think the end is in sight. We're, we're we can't even see the curve, and it may come, but maybe not for a generation. Mm-hmm. Um, the one thing that continues to frustrate me is that we continue to handicap ourselves and our infrastructure on purpose. Like we're trying to slow ourselves down for some bizarre reason because we feel we're being too progressive. I, I don't know. And so, I, I, you know, this is a point of frustration, but it's something where I feel like, you know, we, we, are, at the, we are on the cusp of, of greatness when it comes to our wireless networks and the things that we can do, and yet we're continuing to resist this as if we're, you know, we want to keep doing the telegraph and we can move forward with the mm-hmm. phone and everything else. So it's a, it's a, it's a, big, bright, beautiful world out there for wireless, and, and it's great to watch it grow. Thank you. Um, I'm going to address this primarily to, I guess, to Tim Piccarelli and Tim Brown, although I guess it's really for anybody on the panel. Um, I mean, I know that you've seen communities, plenty of them, that have successful processes for, for handling co-locations that are um, – that – you know that that work for for your company's needs and that work for the the constituents and the residents of the community and the local governments. Can you offer any thoughts about what are maybe the you know three or four or two or three characteristics of these processes that that really make them most successful for everyone? And and kind of related to that, to what extent are all happy families alike? Um, is there you know is it fundamentally the same process that really works where it works, or do different communities really need different things to 
and, and make different processes work? Um, for, from my perspective, and, and I'm sure t that Tim will echo many of the, the same, same feelings, is that I think the places where the most success is found is to where there's that proactive planning that, that happens at the community level. That's that community engagement. It's that, you know, that conversation that happens before any type of conflict of interest or perceived conflict of interest, which is probably infinitely more accurate, is out there. Uh, getting an understanding and working with you know the major tower operators or the carriers to be able to understand the processes that that we have in place, uh, the security measures that we take to make sure that the assets are are maintained. Uh, I'm originally a Midwesterner, and you know it's the same uh, spirit of uh, the thought that you you don't pollute your cornfield. Uh, you, you rely on that for your revenue. That's your well-being. That's your, your core value. And, and the tower companies, the, the carriers, the wireless operators, they all perform in that, that sensibility. So uh, I think the communities that reach out, the communities that make the effort to understand what it is that the carriers are trying to build out, what the, uh, the tower operators or the, the infrastructure providers are out there uh, providing as a solution, that's where you see, you see the success 100% uh, of the time because they get it. They've taken the, the chance to be able to, to know it or to reach out to learn more. Yeah, I think that's um, I think that's a great summary. I, you know, I like to look at these in terms of a growth cycle. You know, we went through an incredibly expansive growth mode in the wireless industry, and you had a number of of municipalities who um, had a difficult time grappling with that growth. They, they and and so now we're, we had that we had a contraction phase where they tried to analyze what was going on. What's what is this? Are we going to have you know these towers all over our community? And so just like just like what happens with a lot of the buildings, communities, you get your expansive growth, contraction, and then measured growth following that. And and what you see is municipalities, they take are different parts of that cycle. The one thing that I will say that, that I've seen in common with a lot of these municipalities is that um, you know, one of the greatest one of probably one of the most rare gifts that I've seen uh, out there with a lot of these municipalities is the ones who have a great deal of common sense. And, uh, and it's the ability to be able to look at this and to say, you know, um, let's take a commonsensical approach. There is something that our citizens demand that we should provide. And how do we best provide this within staying with our community character? And the ones who are able to grapple with that and to be able to work with the carriers, the ones who come with successful outcomes, it's the ones who take hard prohibitions and will not move from stated positions, even in the face of great common sense, are the ones that constantly are going to be fighting this issue over and over again. And eventually, I think they'll find that they're so far behind the curve. You know, it is a zero-sum game. When the carriers don't spend money in your town, they spend it somewhere else. And when they're not improving your network, they're improving somebody else's. And so it's really up for each municipality to try and emulate the best practices. Just use a little common sense. If I was to say the common element, just, just be smart. Um, I guess I'll just um, wind up with one more um, for Kimberly here. Um, and I'm going to be careful how I'm phrasing this because I, I, I'm not, I don't want to be asking you to interpret the new legislation in any way. <laughs> but um, I know you, you talked about the, the system that's been in place in Georgia for, for a couple of years now. And obviously, um, I mean, obviously this, the, the new statute that, that Congress handed down was a response to a express need for it from from um, carriers and tower companies in many parts of the country. Um, was there the same feeling of a need for it in Georgia, or did the provisions that are in the Georgia legislation really um, cover the needs there? I think in Georgia we're probably in good shape, uh, or, or felt like we were, or on the, we had a way to get, uh, you know, we were working with outreach to get there with the new law, but I do do work all over the southeast, so definitely there is a sigh of relief whenever we get any sort of possible clarification or a streamlining of a process. So um, in Georgia, I feel pretty good, but certainly in the other states where I do do business, I am waiting to see how it all works out and, and hopeful that we're getting there. So. All right, thanks. Can I ask a follow-up sure. to that? Um, in your experience in, in Georgia, what was the reaction? Can you speak a little bit 
to the reaction of uh, local uh, uh, communities, and in that process, what did they identify as their core issues? In well, actually, we were very fortunate with this particular bill. It actually, the catalyst was a bill the year prior that was much mm-hmm. more of a kitchen sink type bill that did deal with new towers, which we we know are a lot more of a hot topic um, when you're talking about a new tower versus a co-location or, or modification to something that's already there. Um, that bill went nowhere. Um, it died, but it really got a discussion going between, obviously, the wireless industry and Georgia Municipal Association and Association of County Commissioners of Georgia, the, the, obviously the, the two statewide groups representing the government side of things in Georgia, and they actually supported this bill. The bill we have was with dialogue throughout the process and testimony throughout the process of those key stakeholders. So really we did not deal with much pushback at all um, during the, the adoption process or during the, uh, the, the legislative process <coughs> and then also after it was adopted. More than anything, it's just informing jurisdictions, getting them up to speed mm-hmm. on a bill, the bill's passage, what it meant to them, where their ordinances were no longer compliant or their process and getting those fixed. Um, surprisingly and, and very happily, we have not dealt with a lot of pushback. So. Great, thanks. Okay, well, we'll just, um, I just want to say a few words to wrap things up here. Um, some final impressions. I think we've had a very productive day. Um, we've learned a lot. We've, we've learned about how co-locations work. Um, their central role in um, not only traditional wireless service, but increasingly in broadband service um, and in public safety um, services. Um, we've learned about many different flavors of co-locations, the expanding world of opportunities for co-location, um, including the um, new frontier of AM towers, um, as well as public safety towers. Um, and we've also had a discussion about how, how governmental processes can can adjust to, to make the co-location process um, work much more easily and in a manner that benefits everyone. Um, now certainly there are challenges to the process as we go forward. Um, I think some stakeholders on all sides um, will want to do some re-examining of their mindsets to ensure that the way they're approaching things is really in everyone's best interests. Um, I, people will also need to think about adjusting to the changes in the governing law. Um, but I think the good news, and, and, and some of these comments about common sense and proactivity really illustrate that, um, is that compared to many of the other challenges we're all facing in our lives and our, um, and our jobs, I, I don't think this is really all that difficult. Um, yeah, we, ha- we do have multiple goals. We have multiple public interest imperatives. But at bottom, we don't have fundamental conflicts. We all want the services. We all want minimum Im- impact. Um, We're not really working in different directions, and I think that if everyone is creative and cooperate, um, that can really go a long ways towards solving the issues um, in in co-location and in allowing the services to be built out in minimal impact ways that people really want. And at the FCC, we're going to be your partners in that effort. Um, Tony, any final thoughts on your part? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Uh, I, I agree with, with almost everything uh, that, that that you said. And again, I want to thank the uh, the commission, particularly the Wireless Bureau, for making possible uh, this re- I, really informative session today. I know that uh, I have learned a lot uh, personally, and uh, I know Natoa and our uh, urban, suburban, and our rural uh, communities are looking forward to working with the commission and uh, with with the uh, Industry uh, going going forward uh, to continue to uh, uh, increase uh, the dialogue, uh, increase communication, uh, um, build build trust, so that um, we can spend more of our intellectual capital and and human and financial resources in getting the the best uh, broadband built out in, in our communities and spend a lot less time in in time consuming uh, acrimonious and and expensive uh, litigation so i think it's in in everyone's interest to to come together 
uh, because at the end of the day, like you say, we all want want the same things. And uh, through dialogue and trust and communications, I think that there are common sense uh, solutions that uh, we that we can arrive at for for the the, the betterment of of our constituents and and your customers. So thank you very much. Um. Before we go, I, I do want to thank everybody whose um, contributions have been you know, critical to making today work. First of all, every one of our speakers, um, thank you for volunteering your time. Um, you've all been wonderful. Um, um, Dan Abeda and Don Johnson from my staff, who have not only been um, the moderators, but have put a lot of work into um, into putting together this whole program. Um, Jim Schwartz has helped us out. Cecilia Solhoff, who's, um, you know, keeps track of all of the logistics um, and absolutely critical. Um, Jane Jackson for her support in the front office and Jennifer Manor in the Public Safety Bureau. Um, everybody who's helped out with monitoring the computer screens, taking questions, um, ushering, um, our audiovisual staff, once again, doing a great job. Um, PCIA helped us out with um, lining up some of the speakers, um, and, and that was very important. And also, especially Natoa, um, Tony Perez, and Steve Trailer, um, you, you are our partners in this effort, and um, it's, as always, great working with you. Um, just as a reminder, um, the webcast and the, um, the handouts and the presentations will be available on our website. Um, there's also, from our um, last session on February 1st when we talked about DAS, those are on the website as well. Um, we're looking towards more events in the future, so um, you know, keep an eye on it. Um, I've been asked to people should um, leave this room by the door in the far corner there. Um, apparently there's something else going on, so that's the help things if you go out that way. Um, those of you who are traveling, have a safe trip, and good luck to everyone.